We, <coughs> excuse me, we are on the record at the beginning of media number one, volume two. My name is contracted by Hahn and Bowersock. Please begin. We're on the record at 9.04 a.m. on July 13th, 2017. I'm Jessica Chan, and with me are Rahul Kolekar, um, Monique Winkler, Michael Foley, Jason Habermeyer, uh, and not yet with us is Mark Katz, but we are officers of the Commission for the purposes of this proceeding. We are today resuming the examination of Elizabeth Holmes, which was adjourned on July 11, 2017. Would counsel please identify themselves? Uh, Stephen Neal, Cooley LLP, on behalf of Elizabeth Holmes. Uh, John Dwyer, also of Cooley. David Taylor of Theranos, on behalf of Theranos. Chris Davies from Wilmer. Bill McLucas, Wilmer. Allie Leeper from Cooley. Testimony today is pursuant to a commission subpoena, which has previously been marked as Exhibit uh, 191. Ms. Holmes, do you understand that you remain under oath? I do. Let the record reflect that a copy of the formal order of investigation in this matter, as supplemented, will be available for examination during the course of this proceeding. So before we get started, um, I wanted to give to you what was previously marked as Theranos Exhibits 191 to 200. all to you. If you could just take a quick look and just let me know if um, you recall that we went through these exhibits uh, earlier in your testimony on, t on Tuesday. Just for the benefit of counsel, we just have to remark because of the numbering error, so. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Those exhibits look right to you? I, I think so. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So, uh, as Mr. Kolekar just explained, there was a numbering uh, issue in our exhibits, so we do need to remark these exhibits. Um, so, I'm just going to do this in front you of you. You need to remark each of them? Yes, just uh, the first 10. So, um, let the record show that I am marking what was previously marked as Theranos Exhibit 191 as new exhibit 209. And that back to you. And I'm marking what was previously marked as Theranos Exhibit 192 as an Exhibit 210. I'm marking what was previously marked as Exhibit 193 as 211. <coughs> I'm marking what was previously marked as Exhibit 194 as Exhibit 212. I'm marking what was previously marked as Theranos Exhibit 195 as Exhibit 213. I'm marking uh, uh, what was previously marked as Theranos Exhibit 196 as Exhibit 214. I'm marking <coughs> what was previously marked as Theranos Exhibit 197 as Exhibit 215. I'm marking what was previously marked as Exhibit 198 as Exhibit 216. Excuse me. I'm marking what was previously marked as Theranos Exhibit 199 as Exhibit 217. And I'm marking what was previously marked as Theranos Exhibit 200 as Exhibit 200. 
And then um, just to take back exhibit, this is in the exhibit uh, 209. Ms. Holmes, do you understand that you are appearing here today pursuant to Commission Subpoena, which is now there in Exhibit 209? I do. Thank you. Council, do you have any questions? Okay. All right. So these will be here just in case we need to go back. <coughs> oh, thank you. So when we left off on Tuesday, we were talking about Theranos' relationship with Walgreens. Do you recall that? I do. Okay. you what was, has been previously marked as Theranos Exhibit 50. Exhibit 50 purports to be a June 25, 2012 email from and with a copy to the subject line is meeting with starting dates number WAG-TH-00002493. And there are a number of attachments. Um, the first attachment it has Bates number ending 2494. The second attachment has Bates number ending 2499. And the third attachment has Bates number ending 2500. Have you seen Exhibit 218 before? I'm sorry, have you seen Exhibit 250 uh, before? Um, I, I don't think the email um, I recognize one of the attachments as our CLIA certificate, which I've seen before. I'm not sure about the meeting minutes in this uh, list of CPT codes. Okay. So if you, if you turn to the email um, on 2493, uh, it's an email from, do you understand what his role was at Walgreens? Generally, yes. What was his role? Um, it began, I believe, as part of it, and then I understand he got involved in medical affairs and general innovation initiatives for Walgreens. And you were in discussions and was part of the Walgreens team that you were in discussions with pertaining to the Theranos Walgreens relationship, right? For a period of time, yes. Okay. So he, it looks like he's sending some minutes from a meeting that took place Thursday and Friday. Um, and so if you turn to the first attachment, these are the meeting minutes. Uh, the attendees here appear to be Elizabeth and Sonny. So uh, did you attend this meeting on June, June 22nd and June 23rd of 2012? I don't remember it, but I don't have reason to doubt the, the document. Okay. And if you would turn to 2495, which is the second page of the attachment, you'll see in the middle of the page, um, the second bullet point says contract terms and timing. Um, and then there are four diligence items in 30 days. Do you see that? I do. Uh, one of those items is the, the test menu. Theranos will provide Walgreens with a copy of the test menu incorporated as Schedule J and Operations Manual that the Theranos um, trained Walgreens technician will utilize during the PSC. Do you understand PSC to be Patient Service Center? I do. Okay. Um, and then it goes on to say, they gave us a clean copy of the test menu and they has it estimates approximately 600 tests. So if you then turn to the last attachment, this appears to be a, a test menu. Do you see that? Do you recognize do. this test menu? I, I generally recognize that we had files that were like this uh, with CPT codes. I don't know necessarily this one specifically, um, but we I, I've seen documents like this before. Did you give this test menu to the Walgreens team during that meeting or after that meeting? I don't know. Do you know if Sunny Balwani gave this test menu to the team after that meeting or during the meeting? 
I, I don't. I wouldn't be surprised if we did, uh, but I don't know for sure. Okay. Um, so there there's appear to be pages and pages of tests here. Mm -hmm. Could Theranos' TSPU perform all of these tests at this time in June 2012? So I think there's two parts to that, which we were talking a little bit about um, in our the day before yesterday. Um, the first is um, the architecture of the system, and we were very focused on capability in terms of the device itself or the platform with our small sample methods being able to perform this range of tests. There were additionally a number of these for which we had already developed assay development and validation reports, um, which I can recognize on this list. So, you, so your testimony is that Theranos had developed all of these tests, um, or at least assay development, or all of these tests were in assay development phase at this time in June 2012? I don't know if all of them were. I know that at least a subset of them were, um, or had development reports associated with them at that time. Did you tell any of the attendees at this meeting that that was the case, that all of these tests were actually in assay development mode and had not actually been transferred to the TSPU yet? I, I don't know. Um, I also note that this is now in the time of the clinical lab, and based on the email you just showed me, I think we were talking at that point about the lab being able to handle a whole set of tests, so I, I don't know that we were even specifically talking about all of these being on finger stick. Okay, you can put that aside. Uh, do you, did you participate in a series of meetings in the summer and fall of 2013 to advance the Walgreens relationship? I, I, I don't, I can't sit here now and remember specific meetings, but I'm sure I was you know, at a high level engaged with uh, Walgreens leadership during that time. In the summer and fall of 2013, would that have been around the time that Theranos had developed or modified its uh, commercially available machines in order to test smaller samples? So my understanding is... What was the time again? Summer and fall of 2013. <coughs> my, my understanding is that in the fall, yeah, in, in that period is when we, we implemented our small sample volume chemistries on those platforms. Okay, do you remember when that was, what month in 2013? I don't. I don't. Um, if I told you it was around uh, in sometime in July of 2013, would that seem about right to you? I, I'm not sure. I, I, my memory is that the first LDTs were coming up in the lab later, very, very close to launch, but it's possible that there was work uh, toward it ongoing at July. Okay. During Sorry, when, when, when do you remember the LDTs coming online? My, my memory is that it was right before we um, actually began serving patients. Um, the, the, many of those validation reports were right before the first patients were coming in. Did you discuss with Walgreens the, some of those throughput issues that you described earlier in your testimony during those meetings in summer and fall of 2013? My memory is that at the time we invented the nanotainer, at that time we discussed the invention of the nanotainer uh, and its ability to work with what we talked about as high throughput testing methods for our small sample assays in phase one and then focus on the device in phase two. So you developed the nanotainer in order to be used with the modified protocols on the commercially available um, platforms? I, I don't know if we knew exactly at the time we developed the nanotainer what hardware the test would run on, but the concept was that then a lot of samples could be collected from a lot of different locations and sent to one place to all be run at the same time in, in a high volume type of way. But it sounds like you recall having developed the nanotainer around the same time that Theranos was looking into potentially modifying these commercially available machines, is that right? No, I, I think the nanotainer development happened much earlier when we shifted our business model with Walgreens from being focused on the TSPU at the store to being focused on a phase one, phase two type relationship um, that started with centralized labs. 
Okay, so so when did you develop the nanotainer? Yeah, we were talking about this the day before yesterday. I don't know specifically. Um, I believe that it would have been a around the time or shortly after uh, the um, initial CLIA certification as a centralized lab, but I, I don't know. Okay, so I asked you a question about whether you discussed the throughput issues mm -hmm. um, that you had testified to earlier with Walgreens. Yep. Did you discuss those issues with them? My, my memory is that I talked about it in the context of the nanotainer invention prior to 2013, and that the nanotainer model would facilitate testing in a high volume way in a centralized lab and we then later picked what hardware platforms to implement our chemistries on. Okay, but did you actually talk to them about some of the issues you were experiencing with the fact that the TSPU at that time could not conduct the same number of tests that you would need to conduct in order to receive a number of samples from, la uh, from patient service centers? Did you discuss that point with them? The, the TSPU could only handle one sample at a time? Yes. Um, I'm not sure. I, I, I can't remember a specific conversation. I don't know. Did you ever discuss with them the fact that Theranos was in the process or had developed a solution to this throughput problem or the, the fact that the TSPU could only um, perform uh, testing on one sample at a time? It's my understanding that part of our ongoing communications with them were around the fact that we were developing capacity to be able to handle large sample, large numbers of samples at a time. I don't know what details were discussed in that context. How did you gain that understanding? I have memory that one of the metrics that they were looking at for moving beyond what they had initially referred to as a pilot stage was our, our throughput capability, how many samples we could handle in our labs. And, um, and I know that that was important to them. But you don't know, I guess, if I understand your testimony, you don't know whether, you know, the, the Theranos team communicating more directly with Walgreens disclosed Theranos' solution to the throughput issue. I, I don't. Yeah. So you also don't know whether uh, you or anyone else at Theranos would have disclosed to Walgreens that Theranos was using um, commercially available machines and modifying the protocols on them? I don't. I mean, we, we generally considered that implementation of our chemistries to be trade secret, and we filed non-public patent applications on certain parts of it, and um, so I, I wouldn't expect that we would have gotten into detail on that. I, I thought that we had talked about it as ways we could implement our chemistries in high throughput fashion in the lab. I, I don't know the extent to which anything further than that was discussed with them. But why wouldn't you tell Walgreens? I mean, Walgreens was Theranos' most important business partner at the time. Don't you think that Walgreens would have wanted to know what device you were using to process these samples? It was my understanding that they were very interested in the TSPU for phase two. Uh, I am not aware that they were very focused on what hardware that we were using in phase one at, at that time. Um, we talked to them in general about how we were operating our labs, but um, they were not, they were not specific conversations that I'm aware of, of what the hardware platform was in phase one. But at the time that you were marketing Theranos' technology to Walgreens in 2010, yeah. weren't the two parties envisioning that the TSPU would be running the tests? In the stores, yes, and, and we were. Uh, through 2015, when we got our first FDA clearance on the TSPU, our, our thought even going into that year was that we were going to start putting those TSPUs in the store. That was the, the hardware focus for right. Walgreens. So why wouldn't it be important, though, to, to let them know, just so you know, the TSPU is not going to be the device that's going to be performing most of the tests. It's actually going to be this modified commercially available machine. Again, my understanding is that we conveyed to them when we invented the nanotainer that we would be shifting to a model in which phase one was the nanotainer and the chemistries small sample chemistries and phase two would be the TSPU. We then also began adding commercial equipment for doing traditional venipuncture testing. And it's my understanding they were aware that the lab in phase one was doing a lot of different things to be able to accommodate the business model of phase one, which was foot traffic and low cost testing and a better patient experience, including small samples. 
so, so you said a couple things that I just want to follow up on. The, yeah. um, you mentioned that it was your understanding that they understood phase one was about implementing Theranos chemistries. Did you ever use that language with them, implementing Theranos chemistries in, in connection with phase one? I, I think so. Uh, what was the context? I, my memory is the first time is when we were talking about how to change the business model and the creation of the idea of phase one and phase two. And at that time, as we discussed in our prior meeting, the purpose of the nanotainer was to be able to run a lot of samples at the same time. And so the point we were trying to make is if the value to the patient is that they get their collection on a finger stick, they don't care whether it's processed on a device at the store or in a high throughput way in the lab. And so we could develop this nanotainer product to allow the samples to be processed in a high throughput way and then use the device in phase two in the lab. And, and I believe that was what generally led to the establishment of phase one and phase two. Do you recall anyone at Walgreens that you use that language with? So I, I thought that all of the conversations around the invention of the nanotainer, this was part of that discussion. I, I don't know who specifically was in those meetings because it was many years ago, um, but I, I, I believe that that was generally how we described the phase one, phase two model to Walgreens and to others. You, you also, in, in answer to an earlier question, described sort of the, the architecture of the four series mini lab yeah. um, as something that was capable of performing that uh, that that test menu we just looked at. Yes. It, did you ever use that language, the architecture uh, of, the, of the TSPU or the mini lab in connection with any discussions with Walgreens? Um, I don't know if I use that word. Um, I know that part of the Hopkins visit was, as I understood it, essentially evaluating that um, because they were looking at, is this truly differentiated from other point of care technology? And whether the word robotics or architecture or some other word was used, that was, I, I believe, what they saw as differentiating Theranos and why Walgreens was interested in partnering with us. So, so just so I understand that, you, you, you understood Hopkins' evaluation, uh, evaluation to focus on the whether it's, we call it the architecture or the robotics, whatever, the, the, the mechanism of the point of care device as, as, as the focus of their evaluation, is that fair? I'm sure there were other things, and I know Walgreens had multiple interactions with them. My understanding was that one of the things they were particularly focused on was, is this a platform that is capable of running any combination of tests, in so many words, given the way it's designed, essentially. Do you recall performing demonstrations for a number of Walgreens executives during this time frame, summer to fall of 2013? I, I don't have specific memory of them, but I'm sure there were multiple interactions. I know I mentioned that we, we sent a TSPU to Walgreens in Chicago for them to use at their facility as well. I, I don't know if that was in 2013 or at a different period of time. Do you recall um, conducting these technology demonstrations in Theranos' office during this time frame? I, again, I, I don't have memory of specific demonstrations during that time. Oh, uh, but you do recall that there were demonstrations that were done for Walgreens, correct? I, I, I don't recall specific ones. I, I know that Walgreens is a partner for whom we would have done demonstrations. Well, what, did, what was your understanding as to the purpose of those demonstrations? I, I think as we were discussing before, it varied based on the audience that was there and what they were interested in seeing. I, I know at certain periods of time they were interested in seeing the software we were working to build. At other instances, like with the TSPU, they were interested in seeing the TSPU over time, a lot of the focus became understanding the retail operation itself, what collection would be like in store, what the experience would be like in store, and trying to replicate that. Wasn't uh, part of the reason why they wanted to see a technology demonstration also because they wanted to just see for themselves that Theranos' technology worked and it could perform the blood test that Theranos said it could? I, I don't know. You don't know that Walgreens would have wanted to know whether or not your technology worked? 
I, I know that that's why they had us go to Hopkins and they had Hopkins look at it and, and I believe look at a number of different inputs that Walgreens was getting um, on due diligence on Theranos. site. I don't I don't know what they were thinking when they they came to our site in terms of um, what they were looking for in a specific instance. So, in, in the in the um, I guess in the summer fall two thousand thirteen time frame, yeah. if the focus of if, if, is it fair to say that the focus from Theranos' side was on phase one with respect to Walgreens at that time? Yes. Um, W would there be any reason to, to send Walgreens a TSPU in, in 2013 if, if that wasn't part of phase one and not the current focus on, on Theranos' side? So again, I, I don't know if it was in 2013. It may have been before then. But as I look back on that time frame, what's really important to remember is we really believed that we were going to get a large number of tests into the FDA on the TSPU and cleared and move to phase two very quickly. So yes, we were operating in phase one, but we thought phase two is the future of the business. This is where we're going. This is what you know we're going to do. And we thought, based on the assays that we had, that we were really close to it. Right. I, I guess, did you, did you ever explain, you know, in, in, whenever you, the machine was sent to, to Walgreens that, um, that, that it was more relevant to the phase two context of, of the relationship? I understood it was explicit that this is for phase two. You're going to process a single patient sample at a time, um, and and um, I, I thought that had been conveyed well at, at that time. Uh, you thought? Uh, did you think you had conveyed that well to Walgreens at the time? So I, I I was only in meetings with some of their higher level decision makers. I I understood from those meetings that. At least I thought I had conveyed that the TSPU was for phase two, yes. Um, I, I know now that there's been a lot of confusion about this, and I've tried to spend a lot of time thinking about you know, how, how could we have done this better, but at those times I, I, thought, I thought that was understood. During phase two, would, <coughs> was there going to be a slowdown in the throughput of tests? It's a good question. I, I don't know. Um, I think part of the concept was that um, there would be specific. I I, I, I don't know. I, I think I think we thought that if you were trying to get ten patients a day in the store, if that was the target, that you would be able to handle ten patients a day in the store on the mini lab. Um, there there would be potential issues if a lot of them came at the same time, but I, I don't think we ever thought. That there was necessarily going to be a slowdown. Was ten patients a day your target in the 2013-2014 time period for the for, for Walgreens? You know, it's it's the number that I had in my head is when we started out what they thought would be a success. Um, I I know certainly over time and as we moved toward more of a venipuncture model, venous draws for phase one, um, that we started thinking you know how high can we get this number? I guess when did that? in your mind shift uh, when you started thinking more about it being a puncture model? I, I, I don't know specifically. I believe it was toward um, e either the end of 14 or early 15, but I, I could be wrong. I'm, I'm speculating. D did, did, you, uh, did you ever at any point communicate to Walgreens that you were, I guess, making this transition in your mind from uh, thinking about the TSPU to more of a venipuncture model for testing? Well, again, sorry if I didn't say this well. It was my understanding that the TSP was always about phase two. Venipuncture was an alternative to nanotainer for phase one. And um, I, I believe that we did have conversations with Walgreens, especially as we began discussing what we called a rental model with the service centers in the stores about the importance of venipuncture. Um, I, I know also when we moved to all Theranos labor, which as a startup that meant we were hiring hundreds of phlebotomists um, who were certified to draw blood, that there was explicit discussion about venipuncture and in fact said to me at one point that maybe we could get the pharmacists to do the venipuncture because a lot of them had already been certified in doing venipuncture um, based on their pharmacy training. So, so yes, there was discussion about venipuncture. Sure, I guess um, 
But I, I, I understood you earlier to say that, you know, the, sort of the value proposition earlier on was the finger, you know, the patient doesn't care about their experience if they go into the store and get the finger stick, it doesn't matter what, what device they, they get tested on, right? Yes. So I, I guess when did that consideration become, I, I guess, less important to you when, when analyzing the phase one Walgreens relationship? Um, so again, it's my understanding it was over time. Um, I think um, the ability to get a large number of people getting only finger stick depended on what the order was. And so to get certain types of physician practices, you needed insurance contracts because the insurance contract would allow the physician to send the patient to you. And for the test menu we had, to get those physician contracts, uh, we needed contracts with the insurance companies. And the insurance companies essentially said what we care about is cost and an end-to-end -end menu. So as we got more experience trying to get insurance contracts, we understood that the most important thing in phase one was the test menu and the price. And that, in large part, drove the move to venipuncture. So it's your testimony then today that Walgreens was aware that Theranos was moving away from smaller samples and <coughs> finger stick draws to venipuncture? I, I, I can't sit here and say what Walgreens was aware of. I can say what I thought we had communicated and I had communicated in the interactions that we had. I thought that we would communicated that you know, first we were focused on small samples but that over time the real value to Walgreens was foot traffic and therefore venipuncture made sense. I think they agreed with it based on the fact they've now partnered with LabCorp to do just that, but I, I don't know what they were aware of or not. So you keep saying that you thought that you, you would convey this to them. Do you think yeah. that you conveyed it or do you know that you conveyed it? The conversations, I mean, this is many years ago, and I, I can't sit here and say I know within this meeting that I said this because I don't remember the meetings well enough, but I, I know what the purpose of the invention of the nanotainer was and then what the purpose of you know, building, for example, a venipuncture-based lab in Arizona was, and I, I, I really believe that Walgreens understood that at that time because we were changing our entire business model, getting away from being a technology company for them. And that's one of the areas in which we and I made a lot of mistakes was in doing that. And it was because we were trying to make that partnership successful. Okay, so you, you don't know whether you did convey that to Walgreens then? I, I can't sit here and recall specific conversations and specific words. So, so you just mentioned something that, that I think, you know, is, is interesting to me, the, the um, this idea that you know, once once it became clear to you through the insurance contracts and and working with doctors' offices that um, that getting the full menu w w was important. At, at, th at that point in time, essentially, your company is just turning into a lab services company. Is that mm -hmm. is that fair? Yes, and, it is. And, and it moved away from its model of of sort of the the drop of droplets of blood being a differentiator, right? In some ways, again all the time we were working toward getting the TSPU into the FDA and cleared for phase two, right? So phase one is you're trying to get market share, okay, essentially create a channel, and then come in with this technology in phase two. Sure. I, I, I guess I understand that, but it seems like at that point in time, the phase one and phase two are somewhat on divergent paths. I mean, you're, you're trying to gain market share, but with a technology that is pretty different from, from what you're considering in phase two. Uh, in, in your mind, what was your, how are we going to bridge that gap? Yeah, so if you look at our mission as a company, it's access to health information. So access to us, what we began to understand, if you look at a lot of the customer feedback, it was about cost. People couldn't afford lab testing, and we were offering low-cost lab testing. And so cost, convenience, um, the experience, that was all part of what we were building in phase one. Still with venipuncture, we were trying to do smaller samples, we were using butterfly needles, we were trying to invest in technology, which I can talk about if it's relevant, to make that total draw still smaller, and then as fast as we could get to phase two for finger stick and even smaller turnaround time ultimately was, was our plan. 
But was your company making any money offering low-cost lab testing? So at the volumes we were at, no. Uh, it was my understanding that we believed we could if we hit volume and we thought that the retail footprint and some of what we were doing on changing the law to allow consumers to order tests would create that volume, but we never got to that point. And, and so was the decision on you know how to price Theranos tests in a Walgreens purely based on capturing market share? <clears throat> so at a high level, it was you know, going back to my example of the four dollar lab test, right? We we wanted to provide a technology business model in lab testing. So we we believed that we would ultimately be able to make money, but what we tried to figure out is what is the lowest price that we could possibly charge so that we're still breaking even or getting a little bit of profit, um, but changing access for people. So it's kind of like Walmart versus Neiman Marcus in terms of the, the pricing and the business model. Right? Walmart is high volumes, really low margin. Okay, so going back to the demonstrations then, um, do you, did you instruct anyone at Theranos to, to move mini lab devices or the TSPU into the CLIA lab in order to, uh, because you were preparing for a tour or a technology demonstration, do you recall ever doing that? Move them into the CLIA lab? Yes. I, I don't recall doing that. I mean, there, there were TSPUs in the CLIA lab running some tests, as we've discussed. Okay, so you don't recall ever moving more devices into the CLIA lab for that purpose? I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I can't sit here and say that we never did, but I can't sit here and recall a specific instance. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think so, but I, I don't know. Do you recall a meeting that you had with Walgreens executives in July 2013 in which you conducted a technology demonstration? I, I, I don't. I don't remember. <coughs> so while she gets the document, yeah. would, would there be any reason to move mini lab devices uh, into either the CLIA lab or the R&D lab for the purposes of a tour? I mean, I remember we were always really focused on protecting sort of areas where we had open devices or things we thought were trade secrets. So it's possible that we decided, okay, we're going to bring people to one place, so anything we want to talk about, put there. I, I don't have specific memory of specific instances and can try to talk about any specific instances that you want to talk about. Okay, so I'm handing to you what's been marked as Theranos Visit 219. Exhibit 219 purports to be a July 12, 2013 email from with a copy to you, Elizabeth Holmes. The subject line is re-demo results for 711, and the starting dates number is THPFM 00006-6413. And there are two attachments. The first has a uh, starting dates number 64618 and the second has starting dates number 64620. Have you seen Exhibit 219 before? I, I don't recognize it, but I don't have any reason to doubt this email. What is Exhibit 219? <coughs> uh, it appears to be an exchange about demo results. Did you receive and review Exhibit 219 on or about July 12, 2013? I, I don't know. So if you turn to the last page, or the second to last page in the email, which is the first email in the chain, you'll see there's an email from who's writing to you, and do you see that? I do. And he says, hi, Elizabeth. Attached, please find the six demo reports for today. All out-of-range values are in red font. And then he goes on to say, please note the following. Creatine has been removed for all reports as per a suggestion. Do you see that? Yes. Uh, then he goes on to say, vitamin D has been removed for all male health panels as per suggestion. Do you see that? I do. He goes on to say, TT4 and TT3 has been removed for all thyroid panels as per suggestion. Do you see that? I do. 
And then he goes on to write, FT4 has also been removed from the thyroid panel in F2. Do you see that? I do. Did you understand this to mean that it was removing certain results from test reports? I, um, yes. What was your understanding as to why he did this? Um, well, again, the clinical lab had not gone live at this point. So, um, I mean, going back to my prior comment, my understanding generally is if anyone who was reviewing the data had a concern about the data, don't include it on the report. Okay. And you said your understanding was that you shouldn't include it on the report. Where was that? What was that understanding based on? Um, my general understanding of the fact that if you have a result that you think might not be accurate, it's not good process to report the result. So had the lab gone live and you were yeah. conducting patient testing and a patient was coming to you and they were coming to you for diagnostic testing and so their physician had ordered a number of tests including some of these like vitamin D and TT4 and TT3 mm -hmm. and you had some questions about the results that came out of those tests, would it be appropriate for you to remove those tests from the report? Wouldn't the patient I mean, the patient needs that for, its, for testing, right? Why would you be removing results from reports? So again, I was not directly involved in this. The laboratory director would make that decision based on whatever the right thing to do in the lab is. Who was the lab director at this time? This is July 2013. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know if had started or... Okay, so you're not sure if he was the lab director, but so who would have made that decision then to remove test results, if not him? I, again, the lab wasn't live at this time, so I, I don't know that we had all those processes and, and SOPs in place yet. Did you instruct him to remove results from test reports? I, I don't know if I specifically uh, told them to do that. I, again, it was my general understanding that if there was ever a concern about a result, you wouldn't report it. Where, where did you gain that understanding from? Did somebody tell you I, that? Um, I don't know. I, I think it was just basic process that we wanted to make sure the results we were reporting were correct and I, I don't know for demos like this that um, there were specific test orders even coming in I think I, I mean this was this was in an R&D environment but if some of the results came back incorrect how did you know that the results that you did report were correct I, I, I don't know I, I'm not a laboratorian I didn't oversee the labs I trusted my team to make those decisions. So who here were you trusting to make that decision? In this case, if he was reviewing the data, I would defer to him on his interpretation of the data. You're talking about? Yes. And what were his qualifications to do that? Um, again, I, I speculated a little bit on what I thought his training was. I'm not completely sure, but my understanding was that he was qualified to become ultimately a lab director. But at this point in time, what was your understanding of his qualifications to make this determination? Um, his background in statistics and data analysis. His background in statistics and data analysis. Yeah. And you hired him for this position, correct? No, we, we hired him many years before as a scientist and then promoted him up within our organization over time. So you promoted him to this position? We promoted him into product development and ultimately Sunny decided to make him a lab director. But here, as we're looking, July 2013, he was in the role to make this decision because of you, correct? I mean, again, I, I was the CEO of the company, um, so I, I you know, um, take responsibility for this company. Um, I did not, in this role, I did not directly oversee the labs, but I, I tried to pick people who I trusted to do this right. And so who was overseeing at this time? To the extent that he was engaged in anything in the clinical lab operations, uh, was the ultimate decision maker at the time he became clinical lab director. I don't know when that was, and Sonny was overseeing anything associated <coughs> with operations in the laboratory. But I don't see Sonny or on this email. Why, why didn't you include them on the email? Uh, again, I, I. It's July of 2013. I read this as a technology demo that was done in an R&D setting um, prior to the lab going live. And, and I guess 
what's the different? What was the difference in your mind between uh, the importance of results in an R and D setting versus the importance of results in a in a, in a CLIA setting? I understand the results to be important across the board. Um, I believe there was a different process in place once the lab went live for how decisions like this were made um, based on the authority and discretion of the lab director. I, I, did, did you communicate any distinction for, to the, the Walgreens folks receiving these, uh, these demonstrations that, um, that, that, that their house didn't have those SOPs in place at this time? I, I don't know. Did you tell anyone at, the, at Theranos to communicate that to, any, to these folks at Walgreens? I, I believe that Walgreens understood the lab wasn't ready to go live yet because we hadn't gone live and they were pushing us really hard to go live as soon as possible. Um, so they, they certainly knew we weren't operational at that time. I, I don't know what else was discussed or what the circumstance of this demo or, I mean, frankly, I don't even know if this was for Walgreens. I, I defer to you if you're saying it was. Well, why don't you take a look at the attachments? So the attachments include lab reports for and. Does that ring a bell to you? Do those two names sound familiar to you? I, I generally recognize him. I, I don't recognize. Who's I don't know. You don't know whether he's a Walgreens was a executive or not. I'm I'm I th I'm not sure. I I think so, but I'm not sure. So instead of removing the results entirely, why didn't you just instruct him to just include the results, but maybe either indicate that it's out of range or just indicate that they needed to redraw for those results? Why not go that route? I, again, I'm, I'm not a laboratorian. We thought the right thing to do, I, I, I believe, if there was a result that was incorrect, was not share the value. We thought that was, um, that was not proper. But you, you must have known that Walgreens would want to know that all of the tests that they were, that were being performed would be performed correctly. So why, why wouldn't you want to be as transparent as possible and, and let them know, actually, there were some issues with, it looks like, at least six results. So what's your answer to that? Again, I, the lab was not even live at this point. I don't think they came in with specific test orders. I think that... The team was picking tests to do and made the decision that if test results were wrong, they shouldn't be reported. I, I, I don't know anything further than that. But isn't another reason uh, why you wouldn't want to include any indication that there were questions about the results that had you put something like an out of range result <coughs> or you know needs redraw that that would raise questions with Walgreens? I mean, I'm, I'm speculating, but my guess is that the bigger issue would be that if you potentially communicated something that there might be a medical issue with someone, and there actually wasn't. But th you said this is for an R for R and D purposes, right? Yes. So no one was going to be relying on the results of these tests anyway for medical treatment, right? Correct. So I guess why in an R and D setting would you apply the protocols that are used for clinical lab? We, we were trying to do the right thing. We, we were trying to report results that we believed in and not report results if we thought there was any issue. And if there was an issue, we would need to understand why. And I, I, I believed that our team was trying to do the right thing. I, is it fair to say that at this time, Theranos was trying to demonstrate to Walgreens that it was technologically capable of, of, of running tests in a, in a lab <coughs> setting? I, I don't know what the circumstances of this demo were, so I would be speculating on that. I, I know that we were very focused on showcasing the finger stick experience, on training their technicians, on creating the front end. We certainly you know, had gone through the CLIA certification process and were very focused on trying to put the right infrastructure in place from a CLIA perspective um, on an ongoing basis uh, as we led up to launch. Sure, sure. I guess j just more basically, I mean, if uh, was it your understanding that if Walgreens uh, didn't think that Theranos could run tests, um, it wouldn't it wouldn't allow Theranos to open its stores? I mean, I I don't know. I, I, we would be speculating. I I know that 
Um, ultimately, you know, we ended up with a all venipuncture model. Had that, if, you know, had we talked about doing that at this point, I, I don't know what that conversation would have been. I, I, was it important to you in the summer and fall of 2013 to demonstrate that Theranos could perform clinical lab testing on blood samples to Walgreens? Of course, absolutely. And so when did Theranos end up rolling its services out with Walgreens? So I think the first patient in California was in October of 15, and the first one in Arizona was in November, I'm sorry, of, of 13. And um, the first one in Arizona was in November of 13. Okay, so at the time of this technology demonstration, you're about three months away mm -hmm. from going live yeah. in the patient setting. Did it concern you that a number of tests weren't working on Theranos' devices? <coughs> okay, I, I, I know that we made mistakes in our clinical lab, and I picked people who I trusted and believed in to do the right thing here. I believed that as issues were raised, we were looking into them, doing root cause analysis and solving them. I believed that <coughs> um, when our lab director signed off on validation reports, it meant that we were, we were in good shape. And I know that we made so many mistakes on this front, but we were, we were trying to take this forward and at that time thought that thought that we were doing the right thing. Do you know if any of these issues were ever resolved that the Theranos device was unable to yeah. test for creatinine and vitamin D and TT4 and TT3 and FT4? Do you know if I, I believe all at least of those, some of sorry, those. Let, let me just finish I'm my sorry. question. I'm sorry. Do you know if any of those issues were finally resolved? I, I believe that it least a number of these were validated in the lab as LDTs later, yes. On the TSPU? I, I think so, some of them. <coughs> Which ones? I, I think vitamin D was, and I think some of the thyroid markers, I don't know which ones specifically. So you'll see that, um, you know, we, we looked at a couple of the reports that are attached to this email. Yeah. Um, there are reports, um, and if you look in the uh, if you look on 64613, which is the first page of the email, it looks like getting ready to send these reports out. Did you ever tell that a number of the <coughs> tests that were run on their blood samples were actually removed from the reports? I, I don't know. <coughs> I, again, I, I don't remember interactions around this. Okay, you can put that one aside. I'm handing to you what's been previously marked as Theranos Exhibit 63. Exhibit 63 is a letter agreement dated December 31st, 2013, titled Amended and Restated Theranos Master Services Agreement with beginning dates numbered WAG-TH-0000099. Have you seen Exhibit 63 before? I, I think so. What is Exhibit 63? Um, I believe it's the amendment to our agreement with Walgreens. Did you receive and review Exhibit 63 on or about December 31st, 2013? Um, I, I don't know. Okay. Um, if you turn to 104, which is the last page of the, uh, page of the agreement, is this your signature on it the is. right? Yes. Okay. So do you believe that you would have received this on or about? December 31st, 2013, and signed it on that date as well? Yeah, I believe I signed it on that date. Okay. So if you look at the second page of the agreement, which is 100, under number one, national rollout, 
says the parties shall work together to develop a forecast that details the anticipated rollout <coughs> dates for Theranos services in individual U.S. states and territories. The parties are committed to taking all, all steps reasonably necessary to ensure a successful national rollout of the Theranos services. And you can go on and, and read the rest of the paragraph if you wish, but nowhere in this paragraph does it say that there is a binding agreement between the two parties to roll out nationally, is there? I'm sorry, the question is, does this paragraph say whether there's a binding agreement to roll out nationally? Yes. Can just read it for a second? Um, no, this paragraph says that they're committed to taking all steps reasonably necessary to ensure a successful national rollout. Okay. Are you aware of any contracts or agreements that would bind Walgreens to roll out Theranos services and wellness centers nationally? I, my, my understanding was that this agreement, and even going back to our initial press release that said we were going to roll out nationally, that, that was the intent of this, and both of us had ways to get out of the contract if we decided it wasn't going well. Yeah. Okay, so so, what's the answer to my question? Are, are you aware of any contractual agreements between the two companies that would bind Walgreens to roll out nationally with Theranos? Uh, honestly, that was my interpretation of, of what this was. What, what what's this your is referring this, to? This, referring this, to this, this agreement, <laughs> yes. This amendment was saying, we're, we're going to do this, we're going to go out nationally. I think they say later, in here that they're going to build out a certain number of what they call gold spaces. I, I I recognize that this language does not say this is a binding agreement to be national, but that was my understanding of the purpose of this amendment. So if you turn to 101, there's a provision at small d. And it says, notwithstanding anything to the contrary, Theranos agrees that it shall not, without Walgreens prior written con consent, offer services or collect samples through CVS Caremark Corporation's minute clinics or their equivalent in exclusive Walgreens markets. In the event Theranos desires to utilize such clinics in non-exclusive Walgreens markets, it will inform Walgreens in advance and review their rationale for doing so and consider reasonable alternatives that Walgreens may advance. So you understood from this that Theranos couldn't go out and enter into a contract with CVS without giving prior notice to Walgreens, right? Yes. And Theranos had to also consider reasonable alternatives if Walgreens offered reasonable alternatives to Theranos to rolling out with CVS, correct? Yes. Okay. Why don't you turn the page to 102? Under three, innovation fee. What did you understand as to the innovation fee discussions that were taking place between Walgreens and Theranos? My understanding was that ultimately in this agreement, this money was paid um, essentially, as it says here, to be better prepared for national rollout and for um, essentially exclusivity to Walgreens. Was Theranos asking uh, Walgreens to accelerate the innovation fee payment? I, I think we said to them that if they want us to roll out at the pace that uh, they wanted us to roll out, that we were going to need to invest a lot and we needed capital to do that. So what, were, what was your understanding as to the terms under which Theranos would earn the innovation fee, though? Did you have any understanding of that? Um, my understanding was that essentially we were earning it by being exclusive to them and um, by being compliant with the contract. Um, I know there was a, um, 
a, a lot of provisions in the agreement about um, you know, targets that we were both setting for, for rollout. Did you understand that in the 2012 amended master purchase agreement that Theranos wouldn't be earning the innovation fee unless it hit certain revenue targets? Um, I, I, I know the provision that you're talking about. I think we thought that when we moved to this agreement, we were, we were earning it based on exclusivity. And where does it say that you'd be earning it based on exclusivity? Um, I believe <coughs> the section, uh, I mean, what, what I had in my head was the section prior that talks about the exclusivity commitments from Theranos and the associated commitment from Walgreens. So, so, so just so I understand that. Yeah. The um, by December thirty first, two thousand thirteen. Yeah. It was your understanding that Theranos, Theranos's retention of the innovation fee from Walgreens, was based on exclusivity and not on revenue targets. I I don't know that we focused on the revenue targets provision. Um, in the twenty twelve agreement, after that, I'm 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 not sure. I I know to the extent I I talked about it. Internally with Sunny, it was that you know this is money that we're earning for exclusivity. So were you able to identify a portion of the contract that did away with the <coughs> earning event being tied to revenue targets? No. So if you turn, oh, so, sorry, j j I just want to make sure I understand the the yeah. it, so at the end of t 2013, in in your mind, the innovation fee wasn't dependent on revenue targets with Walgreens? I, I'm, I'm trying to remember whether we had any conversations about the revenue targets again after this agreement. I, I, I remember associating it mentally with exclusivity. I, I don't, I don't know, I don't know how we address that. I, I guess in your mind at this time, how did you yeah. think Theranos was going to earn the innovation fee as of year end 2013. Uh, honestly, what I have in my mind is that we thought we would earn it based on exclusivity to Walgreens. Uh, uh, what did that exclusivity in your mind provide? I mean, how is Theranos going to be exclusive with Walgreens? Working only with them for some agreed period of time until we got permission from them to work with other retailers. What was that period of time? I, I don't remember it off the top of my head. I, I could look back at these and try to piece it back together. So what was your understanding then as to when Theranos would be able to earn the innovation fee and, ca and Do you mean count that as revenues? Earn in a legal sense or an account? Okay. Do you understand what my question is? I, I'm kind of, I don't know. What, what is your question? If you could clarify. So you just, you just answered Mr. Polakar's question and you yeah. said, Exclusivity means that at a certain point in time, Theranos will have worked with Walgreens for long enough and not with another retailer. And yeah. at that point in time, Theranos would have earned the innovation fee. Uh, yeah, I mean. Is that your answer? My answer is that by committing to Walgreens that we would be exclusive to them, we were earning this money and that was why it was being paid at the end of December as opposed to based on all these later targets that we had previously put in place. Okay, so at what point in time would the parties decide that Theranos would have earned it because Theranos had stayed true to the exclusivity rights that it had given to Walgreens? It was my understanding, based on conversations with Sonny, and he was the one who was um, looking at this, that because we had amended this agreement, we, we as <coughs> Theranos thought we'd earned it. Through your conversations with Sonny? Yes. Do you do you have any did you have any independent conversations with Walgreens? No. I, I, in other words, is it fair to say that the uh, by the end of 2013, you understood the innovation fee to belong to Theranos unencumbered? I, I did because we'd committed to them that we would be exclusive to them, and uh, and that was how Sunny believed that the payment would be reflected. Okay, if you turn the page to 103, 
under seven additional equity rights. It says the, the parties agree that $50 million of the $70 million payment made by Walgreens pursuant to Section 3 above may be converted at Walgreens' option into equity on such terms as are made available to investors in Theranos' planned equity financing in the first quarter of 2014. The parties also agree that upon signing this agreement, Walgreens will receive an option to purchase up to $50 million in Theranos equity on the terms made available to investors who invested in the prior equity financing, um, e.g. at $15 per share. Did you understand this provision to provide that Walgreens would be given an option to purchase up to, or um, uh, the option to convert about 50 of the $75 million um, accelerated innovation fee to equity and then would also have an option for an additional $50 million in equity in, in Theranos? Yes. You testified earlier. You can put that one aside. So let's take a break after that. that doc, it's been a little over an hour. Okay, let's take a really short break if you don't mind. So five minutes, does that work? Okay. Off the record at 10, 10 a.m. We are back on the record at 10, 25. Ms. Holmes, did you have any substantive conversations with the SEC staff during the break? I did not. So you testified earlier um, on Tuesday that you understood that venous drop percentage and patient, patient traffic were important metrics for Walgreens in evaluating the relationship. Do you remember that? I, I think so. So. I, I don't know if I said that venous drop percentage was an important metric. I, I certainly know that patient traffic is, or was. Did, did you understand that venous drop percentage was important to Walgreens? I, I understood that there was focus on it from certain people within Walgreens, uh, and, and frankly not from others. Uh, who, who is it a focus for? I believe some of the early team that had been focused on the phase one, uh, I'm sorry, the initial TSPU business model. Um, and then over time, as the Boots leadership came in, it became, as I understand it, more about foot traffic. So uh, I guess um, prior, prior to the Boots merger, was, was, did you understand that, that the venipuncture percentage was, was an important metric for Walgreens? I, I know that I, I don't know if it was an important metric to them. Um, I know that some of the the lower level team members were interested in it um, over time. Did, I, I guess just who from who from the Walgreens team do you remember that being important to? I, I don't know. I, I just remember Sunny talking about it. I'm handing to you Weston Marth, Fairness Exhibit Two Twenty. Exhibit 220 purports to be a May 6, 2014 email from Sunny Balwani to Elizabeth Holmes. Subject line is forward final deck with starting dates number THPFM 00015585853 with an attachment with starting dates number. Apparently, we don't know what the dates number is, but I believe it's um, 1558584 it'll be in the next page. Have you seen Exhibit 220 before? Um, I, I'm not sure. Can, can I, is the slant was produced to you guys? You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, it's just, it, that is, do we know this is the attachment that's referred to in the email? Do you guys have a way of knowing that? Yes. I mean, how do we know that? Is that the way we turned it over to you? Or? This, uh, it could be that some of the attachments might have come in a different format, maybe native. They were in native files, which is the reason why the date stamp isn't on it. Um, you have a problem with it? We can always no, I don't have, I just compare sure, another copy. I'm just sort of curious to see whether you're sure. It's we'll check during the break. Okay. You see an exhibit 220 before? I, I don't know. Is this your email address at the top, eholmes at theranos.com? It is. Do you have any reason to believe that you didn't receive this on or about May 6, 2014? I do not. 
So you'll see in the email, um, there's a preceding email from to Sonny Balwani. <coughs> and he writes, attaches the final deck, um, and then Sonny Balwani then forwards it on to you. Do you know why Sonny Balwani forwarded it on to you? I, I don't. I would assume it's an FYI. Okay, so he's trying to keep you in the loop about the Walgreens relationship, right? I, I think so. Okay, so if you turn to the attachment, and the title is Diagnostic Testing, Fairness Partnership. Mm -hmm. If you look on page four of the presentation, I think you're on it already, the top says Diagnostic Testing Program Governance, and there are a number of names. Do you know who was a part of the Executive Steering Committee for Theranos? Um, I, I can see here that it says Sunny, and I believe that was correct. Okay. Well, were you aware that there was an Executive <coughs> Steering Committee um, that was formed between I was. and Theranos? Yes. And did you understand that they were convening on a regular basis to discuss the Walgreens-Theranos relationship? I did. Okay. So, why don't you turn to page six, and the title of that slide is Current Operations Metrics. Do you see that? Yes. And there's a table. Uh, one of the metrics here is average patients per store per day. And you see that in February 2014, it's at 0.8, but in May of 2014, it went up to 3.1. Do you see that? I do. So is that consistent with your understanding then that um, in May of 2014, that there were about three patients per day being seen per s in each store per day. I, I didn't remember how many there were in May of 14, but I, I don't have reason to doubt this. Okay, but it appears that you, you would have been aware of this in May of 2014, right? I mean, I, probably generally. Okay, and then if you move down to Venus draws, it looks like the Venus draw went from 43% in February 2014 to 39% in May of 2014. Do you see that? So it looks like the Venus draw percentage didn't actually change that much. Do you see that? I do. Were you aware that the Venus draw percentage in May of 2014 was 39% at the stores? I, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't remember what I was aware of in May of 14. Okay, but at the time that you received this, and uh, it, you would have been aware from reviewing this that it was at 39%. Honestly, I, I don't know that I reviewed this at the time. Sunny <coughs> sent me a lot of documents, and I didn't always open them. You didn't always open documents that Sunny sent to you? I did not. Uh, was it your general practice to review the documents Sunny sent to you? Sometimes. Sometimes he would just tell me what he thought was relevant that I needed to know. Um, I, I guess you're going to... Did you ever tell him to stop, you know, forging information about the, the Walgreens relationship? No, not at all. Do you have any reason to believe that you didn't review this at the time in May 2014? I, I don't remember reviewing it in May 2014, so I, I just don't know. Do you remember the Venus drop percentage for patient testing at Theranos Wellness Centers being around 40% during the entire period of the relationship? I remember that when we responded to the Wall Street Journal article, I asked a team to calculate it, and they came back and used the number of about 60-something percentage on finger stick, so I, I knew it from that. Okay, so you were generally aware it was something like 30 to 40 percent Venus draw, correct? I, I, again, I, I don't know what exactly I was aware of at that time. I, I know that in 2015, I asked a team to go back and do analysis of it and, and got that number. Okay. So why don't you turn to the, the last page, on page 14. It's titled The Path Forward. And it's, there are a number of bullet points, the first being operations improvement. Do you see that? I do. It says focus on Venus draws reduction and it, uh, reduce new patient check-in time to less than eight minutes and achieve <coughs> 15 <coughs> patients per day per store. Was that consistent with your understanding that Walgreens was looking at a target of about 15 patients per, per day per store? 
I, I thought prior to reading this that it was 10, but um, I, I don't doubt this. Okay, we can put that one aside. So we also testified earlier that Theranos Wellness Centers were only ever opened in 41 stores. Do you remember that testimony? At Walgreens. At Walgreens. Yes. Um, do you know when that last store was opened? I don't. Uh, if I told you it was September of 2014, would that seem about right? Um, I, I actually don't know, but I, I don't doubt that. You don't know when the last door was opened in Walgreens? I don't. This was Theranos' most important business relationship, and you have no idea when the last door was opened? I, I genuinely don't remember it. I she didn't say she had no idea. You, you asked her, was it September? She said she wasn't sure. I, 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 I'm trying have, to tell you exactly what I remember and what I don't remember. Do you have any reason to doubt that it was September, around September 2014? No. Weren't you aware by that time, and certainly, certainly by the end of 2014, that Walgreens would not agree to open any new stores for Theranos? By the end of 14, um, no. You weren't aware that Walgreens was having concerns over opening new new stores and providing Theranos services in them? I mean, I knew we were going back and forth on refining the model of the relationship, but I remember, I don't know if it was the end of 14 or early 15, engaging with amending and expanding our, our contract, potentially around a, a, lentil, a, a rental model. I guess, was it your understanding that Walgreens wasn't going to open up any additional stores at, the, at, the, at that time absent some sort of amendment? Um, I, I don't know. I, I know there were a lot of discussions of continuing amendments, and I know that sometimes the models that we were following did not reflect the exact contracts that we had in place at the time. I, I don't know if I knew that there had to be an amendment. I, I don't think that was my understanding. What, what do you mean by the models you were following didn't reflect the exact contracts? Um, for example, with Safeway, we moved to a CLIA certified lab model, even though the contract reflected a CLIA waiver model, and we never amended the contract. So we, we had partnerships in place where we were operating in a way that was not necessarily consistent with exactly what was in the contract. Sure, I guess, uh, I, turning specifically to this time period of sort of the September 2014 through the end of 2014. Yep. Can you, can you think of any ways in which Theranos was um, operating with Walgreens in a way that was not consistent with your understanding of the Walgreens contracts? I, I don't know if we had worked out exactly as we were collecting funds from people at retail. I think Walgreens was collecting them. We hadn't yet created a system where they were reimbursing Theranos for the monies that they had collected. We figured we'd work that out over time. Um, I, I don't know if we were following exactly the labor and staffing model in the agreement. We were doing different things. I think there was some instances in which Theranos was actually doing the labor for check-in, um, even though we contemplated that that would be Walgreens generally. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's probably others. going to hand to you what's been marked there are no things at 221 and unfortunately they are all loose leaf and not uh, clipped. Maybe we can clip this one. Not 
useful, but no worries. <laughs> but you can try and keep this together. Mm -hmm. I'm handing to you what's been marked as Theranos Exhibit 221. There are copies for the two of you. Thank you. Exhibit 221 purports to be an Excel file that includes a number of rows of font. Uh, the starting dates number is TS-1036239. Have you seen Exhibit 221 before? Um, I think I've seen some of the content in it. I've never seen it like this. Uh, does this? Uh, uh, I'll represent to you that these are. This is the file that um, Theranos provided to the SEC pursuant to subpoena, which is supposed to reflect the text messages between you and Mr. Balwani on your Theranos issued cell phone. Yep. Do you have any? reason to believe that this isn't a, a true collection of those tech, text messages from your work cell phone? No. Okay. So if you turn to um, the page with Bates number looks a little different from mine. Maybe I'm... Are you on 6290? Oh, I'm sorry. I was on the wrong page. Yeah. Yep, yeah, got it. Okay. So you'll see about five messages down from the top. Um, there, it, there's an SMS message on November 19th, 2014, and it appears to be from Sunny Balwani to yourself. Is this Sunny Balwani's email address? Do you recognize it? I think so. Um, and he says, we can't scale with WAG. And WAG, you understand, is Walgreens? Yes. Okay. And then in his next text message, he says, they are terrible and we need uh, SWY and CVS. Do you understand SWY to be Safeway? Yes. And then you respond, it is time. Let's get SWY done this week. We can do it. And then Mr. Balwani responds, they told our team in WAG meeting that they don't intend to open more PSCs until July because we missed their IT integration deadline. Do you see that? I do. And PSCs, again, is patient service centers? Yes. So you were aware in November of 2014 that Walgreens wasn't looking to expand Theranos services to any other stores. Isn't that right? I'm sitting here now reading this exchange. I don't think I would have taken that as definitive that we wouldn't be expanding. If we thought there was an issue, I would have called their CEO or president and said, we need to expand. So you didn't think reading this that there was an issue? I, clearly, I thought there was an issue because we're talking about Safeway and CBS, but I, I wouldn't take a comment made in a WAG meeting as indicative that we wouldn't be expanding with Walgreens. Okay. Did you do anything to contact anyone at Walgreens about this issue, the fact that they raised in a meeting that they wouldn't be looking to roll out Theranos services in any additional stores? I, I don't know. I don't know. So you don't remember contacting anyone at Walgreens about this issue at this time? So I, I, I saw from the other document that you gave me that I believe was already involved at this time. I know I had um, fairly frequent interactions with him that were generally positive. I, I don't remember this text or remember what follow-up happened, but certainly, unless it was coming from a C-level executive, I wouldn't have taken it as indication that we weren't going to be expanding in our relationship. We would have tried to work through the issue. So, in did, I guess, did, did you agree with Sunny's assessment in November of 2014 that, that Walgreens was terrible? 
uh, Sunny uses very strong words to express things. Um, I <coughs> understood that he had been very frustrated with them for a long time. There were specific frustrations about the stores that we had and the fact that the rooms hadn't <coughs> been built out. So I think I, just reading this now, interpreted as I agreed that we should start engaging with the other retail opportunities that we had. Um, we always believed we were going to continue to work with Walgreens. What were Sunny's other frustrations with Walgreens as of November 2014? Um, so the ones I remember are, we talked a little bit the other day about the store footprint, um, being in locations where not a lot of people <coughs> would come into the stores, so they weren't ideally suited for success in terms of foot traffic. Um, we were supposed to have bathrooms in our locations, and there was a commitment around what was in the amendment around gold quote-unquote stores, and I don't know if any of them had been built out. Um, there was also a commitment in that amendment to proceed, I think, with at least three geographies, and they hadn't proceeded with retail construction in those three geographies, which we had understood to be a commitment. So I, I think that was the basis of the, the frustration. Uh, so by this time, did you have an understanding of why Walgreens hadn't expanded to <coughs> those three geographies? My memory is that Boots had had come in and that they were looking at this again and I, I think Boots had different thoughts about the contract and the relationship than Walgreens did and that that was driving a um, sort of re-review of this which ultimately led to some of the discussions about formally amending the contract again. And do you recall when Boots, uh, Boots came in? I don't. Okay. The, um, is, is, so is your understanding that, that the the Boots team wanted to sort of re-review the Walgreens Theranos relationship to, I guess, reconsider how to roll out the stores? I don't know whether they wanted to reconsider uh, rolling out. I, I, I understand that they did re-review the relationship, and I, I, I don't know what they were particularly thinking in it. I think they were sort of re-evaluating everything that the old Walgreens leadership had done. And so that reevaluation, did you understand that that was happening around this time in late 2014? I, I don't know when it happened. So if you look back at uh, that page, there's a text from Mr. Balwani, uh, several lines down, that says, need CTN fixed, our root cause of issues. Do you see that? It's on the same date at 5.12? Yes. What did you understand him to mean by that? Um, I, I don't know. And CTN, is that capillary tube and nanotainer? Yes. Um, so you respond, he says, I know they s seems like they are a mess, and you respond, yes. So it sounds like at that time you understood what he was talking about. You have no recollection of what he was talking about then? Um, I, I don't, and I'm not quite sure whether those are those two texts right back and back are referring to the same thing. They may be referring to some of the earlier texts. Okay. Do you recall any issues with the capillary tube and nanotainer? At this time? Um, at, at this time period, um, I, I, I don't know specifically at this time period. I know we were, you know, on an ongoing basis, particularly focused on training of phlebotomists and trying to minimize the number of collections and redraws. And um, <coughs> if you don't do it right, the sample gets um, what's called hemolyzed, which is messed up. And so there is a huge, you know, ongoing focus on that. Okay. Can set that aside, which I understand might be difficult, but you need a rubber band. So earlier in your testimony, we also discussed that there was a time when Theranos and Walgreens started discussing the possibility of a rental model. Yes. Do you recall those discussions taking place around December 2014? I don't. I, I don't know when they, I, I, I remember it as being on an, sort of a period of time, but I don't know when it started. Okay. 
handing to you what's been marked there in Exhibit 222. There's two copies there. Great, thank you. Exhibit 222 purports to be handwritten notes from December 1st, uh, excuse me, December 10th, 2014, uh, with starting dates number TS-0480486. Have you seen Exhibit 222 before? Not like this, but it looks like these are my notes. <coughs> is this your handwriting? It is. Okay. And uh, up on the upper right corner, there's a date of December 10th, 2014. There's a time of, it looks like 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. And then there's a conference room and a number of people are listed under there. Do you think this was a meeting with Walgreens? I, I do think it was a meeting with Walgreens. I don't think that is correct. Which, which is not correct? Well, at least the time and maybe not even the conference room and the date. I'm not completely sure whether this was at Theranos or somewhere else. I, I, briefly, could you just walk us through how your handwritten notes were treated by your, by your assistants? Um, yes. Uh, so um, sometimes they would uh, prepare a letterhead for a meeting that had the date and the names and the time on it. Sometimes if we didn't have letterhead, we would use letterhead that had been previously produced for something else, and I would write on that. I would take notes and I would give it to them, and they were to scan those notes and put them on the CEO drive that we discussed. So, why don't I just mark another document for you? I'm going to hand to you also a document that's been previously marked as Theranos Exhibit 186. So that 186 purports to be a December 9th, 2014 email to a number of individuals, uh, including yourself, um, with a copy to, again, a number of individuals. Uh, subject line is copy 8 o'clock AM PT, Walgreens Theranos meeting. And um, the Bates number is WAG-TH-0003704. Have you seen Exhibit 186 before? I, I don't recognize it. Okay, and you'll see in the two line, um, it was sent to eholmes at theranus.com. That's your email address, correct? It is. Do you have any reason to believe that you didn't receive this email, or it looks like a calendar invitation on or about um, December 9th, 2014? No, I mean, calendar invitations automatically went to my assistant, so I never saw them coming in, but I don't doubt the email. Okay, so um, when you would receive calendar invites, you would, it wouldn't go to your inbox? Correct. It would go directly to your assistants? Yes. Okay, who is your assistant on the CC line? Um, is she on there? She's not. So where would this have gone to? As I understand it, my Outlook is configured in such a way in which if a calendar invite comes in to eHolmes, it shows up uh, in the mailbox of my assistants, which okay. is EAH office. Okay. Do you know who your assistant was at that time? No. Um, I, I think it started by this point, but I'm not sure. Okay. So in any case, in the body of the calendar invitation, it says 8 a.m. to um, 10 a.m. PT. It's for a meeting on December 10th, 2014. Do you see that? I do. Okay, and then your meeting notes um, have roughly the same information except that it says 10 p.m. instead of 10 a.m. Yeah. Yep. Do you it. have any reason to doubt that these notes were from a December 10th, 2014 meeting? No. Okay, so if you turn the page to page two of your notes, that's 487. You see at the top it says lab data, and then I can't read the word next to it. What is that? I don't know. I'm guessing it might be phase, but I'm phase. not sure. 
Okay, and then underneath it says services and clinic, is that correct? Yes. Okay, and then underneath again in bullet points it says venipuncture and five per day, do you see that? Yes. Did you, um, does this refresh your recollection that you would have been talking about the venipuncture and um, five patients per day in Walgreens uh, stores ser uh, servicing, <coughs> providing fairness services during this time? It, it doesn't refresh my recollection, but I, I recognize the, the words on the page. So halfway down the page, um, it says, there's a bullet point, and it says rental uh, AGMT model. I assume AGMT is agreement. Is that right? I'm sorry, where are you? Halfway down the page. Yes. Do you see that? Yes. Is AGMT agreement? Yes. So does it look like you were discussing with Walgreens executives the possibility of a rental agreement model yes. during this meeting? And then it goes on to say, incentive early years rental AGM agreement. Uh, incentives both winning. What, what were you referring to there when you wrote that? <coughs> I, I don't know. Did you view the rental agreement as with Walgreens as something that could be beneficial to both parties? Absolutely. <coughs> Why? <coughs> because we understood ultimately from the experience we'd had by then that foot traffic was the most important metric to Walgreens um, and that for Theranos we could have control over the space and ensure a good experience so some of the frustrations that had existed in the store model we could resolve because we'd be owning the space completely. Okay, so you can put that aside. Did you tell prospective investors at this time, so this was December 2014, that Walgreens and Theranos were considering modifying the contract to enter into more of a rental agreement model? I don't uh, remember specific conversations, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if we did. We were excited and proud of this. We thought this was going to be the way that we would scale, uh, ultimately. Okay, so, but you don't remember having any conversations with I, prospective investors? I, I don't, I don't. You, you mentioned a minute ago that, that, that Sunny had had some, some frustrations around the Walgreens relationship around that late 2014 time period. Did you ever share any of those frustrations with prospective investors? I, I don't know because I don't remember specific discussions. I, I wouldn't be surprised if, um, if we did because people would ask, you know, what's limiting, I'm assuming people would want to know why we were in the store footprint that we were and what was going to drive growth and therefore that would have been a likely thing to discuss but I, I don't have memory of specific discussions. Do, do you recall Sonny ever sharing his frustrations with Walgreens to any prospective investors in any meetings you attended? <coughs> Again, I, I can't remember specific conversations but I wouldn't be surprised if, if he did. So if the parties chose to restructure the relationships so it was more of a rental model, would that have had any impact on the timing of the rollout of their no services to Walgreens stores? I, I'm sure it would have impacted, but I, I don't know whether it would have made it better or worse. In what way? <coughs> I, I, I don't understand what was controlling the, uh, the rollout pace uh, on the Walgreens side, and I don't know exactly how fast we thought we could build out these locations if we were building them out ourselves. Okay, but certainly it would have taken a few months to get things rolling and to open another wellness center in Walgreens stores. I, I don't know. It depends on whether we were using, for example, their clinic spaces that had already been built out or not. Okay. You can put that one aside. So I want to change gears and now let's start talking about Theranos' relationship with Safeway. Yeah. Uh, why was Theranos interested in entering into a contract with Safeway? Uh, at a high level, it was another vehicle for building a retail footprint and with our focus on people's access to health information, we thought it could be really meaningful to help people start linking diet 
to their health data with the software applications that we wanted to build. Okay, and did you have any understanding as to why Safeway wanted to um, enter into a relationship with Theranos? My understanding is that they shared that vision and um, also were interested in ways to expand their and differentiate their pharmacy. Okay, and in, in what way would they be able to differentiate their pharmacy if they partnered with you? If people were able to access information about their health, it could inform the decisions about what foods they bought and that data could be powerful for people who are dealing with things like prediabetes or diabetes that are diet related. So was what the parties were discussing, and by parties I mean Theranos and Safeway of course, um, at, uh, at the time that you started the discussions, were you contemplating sort of a similar model to what Theranos had been discussing with Walgreens, which is to roll out with Theranos' TSPUs in Safeway stores? At the time we started, yes. Who were your primary contacts with uh, from Safeway? M my primary contract contact was with Steve Bird. Okay, and were any others involved besides Steve Bird? He had a team that worked for him. I well, almost entirely interacted directly with him. <coughs> okay, what about after Steve Bird left Safeway? Who did you interact with then? and he was supported by... Uh, and who was responsible for the Safeway relationship from Theranos? Was that you? Until Steve Bird left, yes, and then Sonny, once Steve left. So Sonny Balwani was responsible for the Safeway relationship after Steve Bird left? Yes. Would he keep you apprised of how the relationship was going and his discussions with Safeway once he took over responsibility? In general, yes, but after Steve left, we didn't have the same kind of frequency of interactions with them. So what happened after Steve left? Um, I, I believe that um, there was a fund <coughs> that acquired them um, and, and I think he was working with that fund to get their thinking about what and whether they wanted to proceed with this vision of the services in the pharmacy space. Um, and it's my memory that the fund really wanted to restart the relationship and we had a lot of disagreements about that because we'd spent so much time working with Steve over the past years and investing in technologies at sort of his request uh, that we didn't want to restart it from scratch. So then what happened after those discussions? Did Theranos ever end up rolling out its services in Safeway stores? No. Why not? We couldn't agree on a, a model to do that. And, and ultimately, uh, by the time we, we did agree, um, it was uh, after the Wall Street Journal articles and we were dealing with the issues in our clinical lab uh, with CMS. to you what's been marked Fairness Exhibit 223. <laughs> exhibit 223 purports to be No, that was previously marked as 186. The calendar, so, but it was. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay, so I'm handing to you what's been marked as Theranos Exhibit 223. Um, and Exhibit 223 purports to be a June 28, 2013 email from to Elizabeth Holmes and Sunny Balwani. <coughs> so decline is Safeway Theranos uh, meeting 62613 with 
updates number <coughs> TS-0034026. And there's an attachment that starts at dates ending 34016. Have you seen Exhibit 223 before? Um, I, I don't know. Uh, and again, this is your email address. Do you have any reason to believe that you didn't receive this no. email? So you can see in the parent email uh, is sending, is attaching some notes from a meeting that you had. And he's asking you to make any suggested revisions that are necessary to make this an accurate summary of our discussions. You see that? I do. Okay, and then he's attaching some uh, notes that he took uh, or a summary of the meeting that took place on June 26, 2013. Do you recall this meeting? I, I don't specifically, but I know we were engaging uh, with him around this time. Okay. So under central lab model in the summary, he says, he writes, Contrary to impressions that some Safeway people have, there is no technological problem with the devices and no plan to go without the devices in the stores. Theranos has determined that the use of the central lab model provides the quickest and easiest way to expand geographically. The central lab contains the advice. In fact, the device is the only way of obtaining results from the nanotainers. Do you see that? I do. Did you make this comment during the meeting? I, I don't know. Do you know if Sunny made this comment during the meeting? I don't. So when writing and referring to devices, do you understand him to re be referring to the TSPU? Certainly in the context of the statement devices in the stores, yes. Okay. Well, he uses devices throughout, so um, you understand that devices here would be, if he's talking about placing devices in the stores, he could only be talking about the TSPU, right? So as we discussed previously, there was a version of the TSPU that could process six samples at a time uh, that we were designing for Safeway. So I'm assuming um, that's what he's talking about in the context of the device in store. Okay. Um, So when you said that Theranos has determined that the use of the central lab model provides the quickest and easiest way to expand geographically, was this the reason why Theranos was looking to change the model so that <coughs> devices wouldn't be put in stores, but that samples would be sent to Theranos's lab? Can you repeat that question for me? Was this the reason why Theranos was proposing to change the business model from putting the devices in store to having samples taken at stores and sent to Theranos' lab. What was what the reason? The reason that is writing in these notes, which is that it provides the quickest and easiest way to expand geographically. At, at this point in time, it might have been. It wasn't what, I guess in a way, it was what uh, drove the original decisions with Walgreens that had happened earlier. Um, I, I, I'm not sure. Um, whether that's how we were thinking of it by mid-2013, but, but it might have been. Did you say that it was or was not the reason why you switched to a central lab model for Walgreens? Well, as we discussed, it was the result of a lot of engagement with both of our regulatory councils and um, sort of decisions about business model. In a way, it, it, it was because it was the quickest and easiest way to expand, but there were a lot of other factors that went into that. Okay, so um, why don't we look at the next paragraph then. It says, the reasons for starting with the central lab model are as follows, and you can read it for yourself, but it, it essentially describes a courier model uh, and the fact that because Theranos would need to be offering a full <coughs> array of lab tests, including esoteric tests, mm -hmm. you would need a courier to come pick up samples anyway, and so if that's the case, why not start with the courier model? Do you see that? I do. Okay, so why didn't you tell during this meeting that it was the regulatory issues that were prompting this move to a central lab model? I, I believe we had that conversation with them previously when we 
sent them our CLIA certificate and became a CLIA certified lab. You believe that that was your conversation? Yes, that, that's why we moved away from what was written in our contract and to being a, a central CLIA lab. So then why are you telling him a different story in the, in the, during this meeting? I, I, I don't read this as being different. We had become a CLIA lab and we were talking here about the fact that from a business perspective, this was the fastest way to operationalize now. And this is now <coughs> mid-2013. <coughs> Okay, um, so when you say that the device is currently capable of performing the routine blood tests, 90% or more of the demand, is that a true statement? You can, so you keep prefacing these by saying when she says it, and I'm just not clear that you've established whether she's saying it, Sonny's saying, or somebody else. Okay. Sure, so do you recall making a statement to that the TSPU is currently capable of performing the routine blood test, 90% or more of the demand? No, I don't. Was that, was that true? Could the TSP perform 90% or more of demand, uh, of the demand for tests? We believed it, it could at that time, yes. What do you mean by we believe they could? This is a few months before we sent in a number of pre-submissions to the FDA trying to get a really broad range of tests um, into the pre-submission process. So we, we thought we had designed a system that, that was capable of doing that. Did you ever tell that the TSPU, uh, that Theranos had only validated 12 tests on the TSPU? As we previously discussed, at this time, no tests were live in the CLIA lab. The CLIA lab was not yet operational. Okay. But this is June 2013, so <coughs> Theranos would have been preparing for the launch in Walgreens, correct? Yes. So you were preparing to, or either had or were in the process of validating those tests, correct? You know, I, I actually don't know if we'd started our LDT validations by then. I, my memory is that they started after this. Okay. So did you tell or anyone at Safeway that Theranos had not validated any of its tests on the TSPU at this time frame, June 2013? I, I don't know if we said those words. I believe he was aware at that point that the CLIA lab, lab was not live and that no tests were live in the CLIA lab yet. But that's a, that's a different uh, question, right? I was asking whether he was aware that Theranos had not yet validated any tests on the TSPU. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what he was thinking. I, I know that we were very clear that the lab was not yet operational. It was my assumption that it would therefore be clear that no tests were live. So you never told him that Theranos had not validated tests on the TSPU yet by this time frame? I, I don't know. What does what currently capable mean to you? Um, I'm, I'm just reading the rest of the paragraph to try to get the context. I, I think that this is in reference to the fact that was still focused and Safeway was still focused on taking the devices through the FDA to get the CLIA waiver to be able to place them in the stores and that we were saying that the technology that we had we believed was capable of going through that process of getting the FDA clearance and CLIA waiver for these tests that would cover the majority of the testing pattern which would have been a subset of the, the tests we ultimately operationalized in the, the CLIA lab based on our understanding of ordering at the time. That, that, that's your understanding of what co currently capable of refers to in this paragraph? Yes. Why don't we um, change tapes? <coughs> this concludes media number one of Elizabeth Holmes. We're off the record at 11.13. We are back on the record at the beginning of media number two of Elizabeth Holmes. The time is 11.15. Ms. Holmes, during that very brief break, did we have any substantive conversations, you and I or anyone else on the SEC staff? No. So did you review Exhibit uh, 223 at that time? I don't know. 
Do you know if you would have sent back revisions as requested? If we reviewed it, I believe we would have. I, I don't know if we did. Okay. Is there anything um, in that first section on the central lab model that you believe would be inconsistent with what you might have told him? I, I don't remember the meeting, so I can't, I can't answer that accurately. Well, is there any statement in that first section of the meeting notes that you believe is not true? I mean, if it's in the context of my understanding of, of how we were talking about things at the time, then no. I, I, I honestly don't know because I don't remember the meeting and I don't remember the context. You can put that one aside. Is there a time when Theranos and Safeway had discussions about modifying the contract in order to um, change the business model into a rental agreement model, sort of similar to what Theranos was, had been discussing with Walgreens? Yes. When did that happen? I, I don't know specifically. I believe we were already talking about it while Steve Bird was still at Safeway, and then on an ongoing basis after that. So when did Steve Bird leave <coughs> Safeway? Would that have been I early 2014? I think it was that sound right to before you? Before this meeting, which was in a uh, meeting was, was before this. I'm handing to you what's been marked. Theranos Exhibit 224. Exhibit 224 purports to be a May 1st, 2014 email from Sunny Balwani to Elizabeth Holmes with subject line re Safeway Theranos. And starting dates number on the document is THPFM 00015586060. Have you seen Exhibit 224 before? I, I, I don't remember it, but I think so. What is Exhibit 224? Um, it looks like an email exchange between Sonny and which he ultimately forwarded to me. Did you review and re uh, receive and review Exhibit 224 on or about May 1st, 2014? I, I don't know. Do you have any reason to believe that you didn't receive it on that date? No. Okay, if you look at the email on the bottom from Sunny Balwani to, um, I'm sorry, Ashley, why don't you turn first to, oh, no, I was right, this is a very long email. So there's an email starting on the bottom of the first page from Sunny Balwani to, do you see that? I do. And here it looks like he's proposing a number of terms to, to Sunny. Uh, to, uh, do you see that? I do. So in the first uh, section, it's titled Exclusive Use of Theranos Wellness Centers. And he writes, Theranos is offering an additional $400 per week in rent for the additional room and locations with two rooms for a total of $1,200 per week instead of eight hundred uh, dollars per week that Safeway proposed an amount significantly greater than any net margin Safeway may be making from immunization and consultations currently. Do you know what he was referring to here? Just to I'm sure I answer the question you're asking, what, what do you mean by that? So uh, did you understand at this time that he was talking about the possibility of um, Theranos renting space from Safeway? Yes. And in that statement that I just read, did you understand that he's proposing to uh, offer more in rent per week to Safeway in order to rent out both rooms in the wellness center? Yes, I don't know what it was more than, but yes. Um, and, and this was taking place in April of 2014, so does that refresh your recollection that these rental discussions were still ongoing at this time? Yes. Okay. Um, and then if you look 
at number two of his email, which is on 607, <coughs> titled Safeway Pilot. He writes, Safeway already knows about our concerns around agreeing to a pilot now that we've already launched. We also can agree to Safeway unilater unilaterally deciding on the pilot success. Do you see that? I do. So at this time, was it your understanding that the two biggest hurdles um, or the two issues that the parties were discussing were really uh, use of the wellness center space and the fact that Theranos wanted exclusive use of both rooms um, and also uh, the fact that Safeway wanted to pilot Theranos services? I, I know those were two of the issues. I, I don't know if if those were the only two, there may have been others as well. Okay, can you think of any other issues that were um, creating this disagreement between Safeway and Theranos? Uh, well, I haven't read this email, and there may be more in here. Um, I, I, I know that we didn't have a good, um, essentially, working relationship with the project team there, and we were trying to sort of replicate what we'd had with Steve Bird, with someone who was just deeply engaged in making the partnership successful. Um, I, I think we were really concerned that the the fund I, I saw in the email here, Cerebris, that was coming in may have different sort of visions for what we were trying to do, and that we'd invested so many years in trying to build something for this that we really didn't want to restart from scratch. Um, uh, there's probably others. Okay. Um, if you turn to 608, which is the next page, under Safeway Exclusivity, <coughs> mm -hmm. do you know what this um, issue was about? Do you mind if I take a minute to read it? Sure. I, I interpret it as referring to our ability to work with other grocery stores. Okay, so Safeway was concerned about Theranos then working with other grocery stores and that there be some kind of provision that, it, that provides for a Safeway exclusivity. Is that right? Yes, and I also believe there were some complexities around what they had previously defined as the, the Black Hawk Network, which were other grocers that wanted to work with Theranos but not through Safeway. Uh, what's the relationship between Blackhawk Network and Safeway? Um, Blackhawk was a program that Safeway had created to try to sell ideas that it came up with to other grocery stores. And they thought that if we provided lab services through Safeway, they could then essentially um, teach the other grocery stores how to roll this out and take a fee on it, and the other grocery stores came back and said, we'd really love to do this, in so many words, uh, but we don't want to do it through Safeway. And so there was a lot of tension about whether Theranos could have a direct relationship with those grocery stores or not. Okay, so if you look in the second paragraph under uh, point four, it says, Theranos understands the concern you shared this morning that if Theranos succeeds in Bay Area by end of this year, and if at that point Theranos exercises the right uh, exit right above, then it will be free to go to any other grocer and not work with Safeway, thus hurting Safeway. However, our concern is that if Safeway doesn't work with Theranos and our partnership with Safeway is failing as it has since May 2013, then we can't restrict our growth with other retailers and grocers just because Safeway doesn't want to work with us or has, pro has proven difficult to work with. Um, did you agree with Mr. Balwani that the relationship with Safeway was failing, and it had been failing since May 2013? I wouldn't have used that word. What word would you have used? That we had much higher expectations for what we would have done by that point. Okay, so it sounds like there were a number of discussions and things weren't going that well starting in May 2013. And, and even before then, I mean, we were, 
we thought we were going to have rolled out to this large footprint that Safeway had done construction on much faster. Okay, and then if you turn back to the first email, or I guess it's the latest email, but on the first page, it looks like Sonny Balwani is then forwarding you the email that he sent. Did he have a practice of doing that? I'm just taking a look at the note. Sure. sure. I, I don't know if it was a practice. I, I recognize that he would do this sometimes. Okay, and you know, and you also see in his email that he's sending you a draft email that he's planning to send. Yes. You see that? Yes. So did he have a practice of also doing that? I, I'm sorry, I thought that was the question okay. you were asking. <laughs> yeah. Um, did he have a practice, that your first question was, did he have a practice of Forwarding to you communications that he's having unilaterally with third parties to keep you apprised. <sighs> My, my read on that is that he sometimes did that, but not always. Okay. Um, and then my second question is, did yeah. he have a practice of sending you draft emails he was planning to send out to third parties? I, I, again, I wouldn't call it a practice. I know that he did occasionally, yeah, but he, he was pretty um, focused on his ability to run things. <coughs> okay. Um, did you, on occasion, when you would receive these emails, would you edit them and send them back to him before he sent them out? I, I wouldn't be surprised if there were instances when I did. Um, there was sometimes, like you referenced, where I would disagree with the way he was attempting to express things. Um, but I, I wouldn't say that that was a routine practice, to my knowledge, or to my memory. Okay. You can set that one aside. So at some point, the rental model discussions eventually failed. Is that right? I, I don't know if I would say it that way. We were we were having those discussions all the way through the fall. Uh, I'm sorry, the winter of 2015, and it was ultimately uh, the CMS sanctions and or I guess at that point it wasn't <coughs> sanctions, but issues with our laboratory that caused the, the final issue in, in the relationship with, with Safeway overall. Okay, and were you having discussions about the rental model throughout 2014 and through 2015? Is that your recollection? I, I, I don't know. Do you remember a time when the communication stopped and there was a period of basically no communication with Safeway? I, I, don't, I don't have a good memory of the starts and stops of the interaction, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there were sort of dead points in the communications. So I'm handing to you what's been marked there in his visit at 225. Exhibit 225 reports via an August 1st, 2014 email from to Elizabeth Holmes with Bates number TS-0046261 and the subject line is Safeway Fairness. Have you seen Exhibit 225 before? Uh, um, it, I, it looks like an email exchange between you and me. Did you receive and review Exhibit 225 on or about um, August 1st, 2014? I, I don't know if I reviewed it then. I, I don't have any reason to doubt that I received it then. Okay, do you have any reason to doubt that you also received this email on the bottom of the page from Bob Gordon to you on June 6, 2014? No. Okay, so um, you'll see in this email that uh, sort of detailing the history of discussions between Theranos and Safeway, and I'm not going to ask you any questions about the content of the email, but um, but you'll see then that he writes again on August 1st, uh, 2014, and he's asking for a response to his last email. Do you recall responding to him? I don't. Do you know if you ever responded? My, my memory is that I, to the extent we were engaging with Safeway, would, would call during this time, but I, I, I don't have 
specific memory as to whether that was around this August time frame or not. Okay, so you don't remember responding either way? To I don't. Okay. Um, do you know if there were any discussions with Safeway after this email in August 1st, 2014? Whether there were discussions in August 1st or? Uh, in the 2014 time frame, but after this August 1st, 2014 I, I don't, I don't. email? I don't know. Do you recall between the first and second of these emails, between June of 2014 and August of 2014, having a conversation with Dick Kovacevic about um, possibly terminating the Safeway Agreement? I, I don't recall during that period of time. Um, I know that in the same way as I was talking with, I believe he was also having communications with people on their board and providing guidance on the best way to negotiate to uh, make the rollout happen quickly. Did you ever think about terminating the agreement with Safeway? Uh, my memory of it is that was more of a negotiation tactic to get them to roll out. Dick thought that the space was a great asset and that we needed to, to get into that space quickly. Okay. Um, what is your recollection as to the next communication that you had with Safeway after this email on August 1st, 2014? I, I, I don't know. I'm going to ask you to lift back that um, very thick document over there, which I believe was... There, and Exhibit 221, thank you. Yes. So, if you would turn to a text message about a third of the way down the page on February 27th, 2015, from you to Sonny Balwani. You say, do you think I should go up to, do you see that? I do. You say, no, uh, you say, no harm if, I'm sorry, Sonny Balwani then responds to you and he says, no harm if you feel right. And then you respond, he's talking to someone in the room, I'm going to wait outside. Do you know who was, who are you referring to here? No, I, I believe this is That's okay. Yes. Um, and then you, s you then also say, very good convo. He really wants to get done. Says, guy I talked to at Cerberus is decision maker. That guy was apparently pissed. I said, note, note, I think to him is what you meant. Do you see that? Yes. Uh, do you remember that conversation with? I, just in reading this, I, I generally um, remember that I, that I met with him. Okay. It, there was apparently there was some meeting that was taking place that you were both attending. Yes. Do you remember which meeting that was? Um, it was either a business council or a business roundtable meeting, and um, I was speaking there. Okay. So you didn't expect to see um, there. Uh, no. Okay. So, um, and it says, do you think I should go up? Do you think that you hadn't had any conversations with him in preceding months before this? Not necessarily. I. I may have been on the phone with him. I just can't remember specifically whether I was. Okay. Um, and then Mr. Balwani then responds, that's fine. We will send them a letter and see if they want to get moving or term. Did you understand him to mean um, terminate, uh, terminated? Or what do, you, what do you understand him to mean by term? I, I, I'd, I'd be guessing. I'm not sure. Well, don't guess. Well, did you have any understanding as to what that meant? I, I would think I did at the time. I just don't know sitting here now. Okay. And then you write back to him and you say, wants to come back with 
to me with how to get done. And Mr. Balwani says, come back where? He says, OK, I get it. I assume you told him rent model. And then a couple text messages down, you then respond, it was implied. Do you see, do you see that? I do. Um, what do you under, uh, what did you mean when you said how to get done? I, I, I don't know. I'm assuming sitting here now that it means uh, rollout. Would you be surprised um, if there if there hadn't been any conversations or communications between Theranos and Safeway from the August 2014 timeframe to this February 2015 encounter? <coughs> I, I just don't know. I, I don't know when I was on the phone with them. I don't know when Dick was talking to some of their board members, and we had other people who were interacting with them as well who were affiliated with us. Okay. Who else was acting on behalf of Theranos to communicate with Safeway? So I, I just uh, understand. I think yeah. Mr. Yeah. Kovacevic, yourself, Mr. Balwani. Um, I have in my mind that some of our board members knew knew some of their board members, and I'm trying to remember who was having the interactions. Um, I, I, I need to think about it. Um, well, if you think about it later. Yeah, 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 I will, I will. Um, Do you recall a letter from in April of 2015? Uh, no. Uh, do you recall uh, a letter that she might have sent to we start the rental agreement model discussions? I don't. Do you, is there a practice of Theranos employees sending you letters whenever they're, you know, especially a, a letter to non-Safeway relationship? Would you expect that somebody would send you a copy of that letter to keep you apprised of what was going on? Generally, yes. Thank you. Oh. What happened to the Theranos Safeway partnership in the end? As we were discussing earlier, um, by the end of 2015, we had discussed a model for rolling out, I think, about 30 stores under the lease rental model that we had wanted to pursue. But by that time, we had serious issues with our, our lab operations that we were dealing with and ultimately terminated with the discussion that if we were to resolve the lab issues, uh, we would go back and um, engage with them on trying to rent out the space. Okay. And so when did those discussions take place on the lab issues? All, all the way through the end of 2015 and potentially into uh, January of 16. Why don't we take a break, keep them oh. an hour and okay. yeah. I, I have just a couple more questions. If we just finish this topic, I think we're close to being out of it. Okay. All right. Yeah, I guess at the, at the end of 2014, did, did you have any expectation that Safeway was imminently going to roll out uh, their own services at, at, at Safeway? I think we always thought that we could if we agreed to some of what they wanted from us, um, if we needed that to supplement our, our footprint. I, I guess, did, but did you have any kind of concrete expectation that stores were going to open in early 2015? I think, I mean, I, I don't remember exactly what I was thinking at the end of 14, but I, I know that because that footprint had already been completely built out with very custom specific details that we designed to our workflow, we knew that, you know, if we said, okay, we agree to certain provisions or compromised on our negotiating position, we would be able to get into it and get a very large footprint very quickly. Do you know whether there were any preparations underway between Safeway and Theranos to roll out stores in the beginning of 2015? I, I don't. You're not aware of any preparations? I, I, I can't remember anything specifically. In your mind, did you have a geographic location where you expected Safeway stores to roll out at the start of 2015? At the start of 2015? Um, what I remember is to the extent we were having sort of initial rollout discussions, there were two options that we spent a lot of time talking about. One was the Bay Area in California, the other was Wyoming. And um, it really depended on where some of these things 
played out with respect to announcement rights and how visible ultimately we thought this was go the deployment, initial deployment was going to be if Safeway maintained a right to terminate after it. We can take a look at that. You're off the record at 11.42 a.m. We are back on the record at 11.56. Ms. Holmes, did you have any substantive conversations with the SEC staff during our break? No. Do you recall a time when Theranos began offering um, blood testing services to Safeway employees? Um, I, I know that there was a period of time in which Theranos handled the samples uh, that were collected by the on-site clinic at Safeway. Okay, what do you mean by handled the samples? So it wasn't um, labeled to my understanding, Theranos, it was the clinic service, and then the clinic would collect the samples and send them to Theranos. Was the clinic conducting finger stick draws or venous draws? Only venous draws for patient testing. I believe people could also opt into a research study in which we would collect finger stick, uh, but not for data that would be reported back to patients. Okay, so the blood would be drawn at the clinics, but then the samples would be sent to Theranos lab for testing? No, I don't think we were, I don't know what we were doing with them when they came to the lab. I think we were trying to focus on how you would train someone to do a finger stick. So the collection happened. I, I do know the samples came back. I don't know what happened after that. Do you know what devices were used to process those samples? I, I don't, it's my, memory that there generally wasn't testing happening on those samples, uh, and just that we were doing the collections for a purpose of beginning to refine that workflow and the training of the finger stick collection. It's your understanding that there wasn't any testing being done on the samples that Safeway employees were providing? I, my memory is that there was some studying of whether the samples had hemolyzed or lysed, you know, clotted or did not have good integrity, but I, I don't think there was actual testing done on those samples. And, and just to understand, you mean the the samples that were done on the finger stick Correct. at the safe point? Correct. Oh, so okay. those people that opted. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. If I was I yeah. so, yes. so with respect to the venous draws then that were done at uh, the clinic, yes. was, was Theranos processing those samples? Yes, those were processed on traditional commercially available machines and or sent to what I had previously referred to as a reference lab, which is a, a third party lab. Did you ever tell anyone at Safeway that those samples were being processed by third-party commercially available machines or being sent out to reference labs? I, I believe so, yes. Okay, who did you tell? I, I don't know specifically. I, I can't remember. Okay, so you don't know either way whether you ever told anyone at Safeway that you were using third-party machines or sending out to reference labs? I remember Safeway helping us to look at UCSF as a closer <coughs> reference lab. So I, I believe that there was discussion about the use of a reference lab because of that. Um, but I, I don't remember specific conversations. Okay, and wh what about um, whether uh, you told Safeway or anyone at Safeway that you were using commercially available machines at Theranos <coughs> to process the samples? I, I believe we did. When did you do that? I think before we agreed to um, do the testing, um, because there was a discussion about the fact that it would just be venipuncture on traditional machines so that we could work through some of the workflow development that we were, we were trying to do that we would not be collecting finger stick for patient testing. And who did you tell that to? I, I don't know. I, I mean, I would assume to the extent I had conversations it was with Steve Bird, but I don't know. Now I want to change gears again. Um, Did you want to be trash coffee? Please. I was about to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it, it's so funny. I, it's the most. It's the least sincere thing I, I ever do because I almost <laughs> always offer the staff coffee when I go down. No, you can't accept it. <laughs> but I didn't do it today. I think the high road I'm not offer. <laughs> okay, I wanted to change gears again yes. now and focus now on uh, CVS. 
Was there a time when Theranus began having discussions with CVS? Yes. All right, when was that? So there was a series of discussion over a period of, of years. Um, I don't know when the first one was, but it <coughs> may have been as early as 2010 uh, or, or sooner. I, I don't know. So around the same time that you might have started discussions with Walgreens and Safeway? I think so. Uh, what were those discussions about? Was it to, uh, along the same lines as what you were discussing with Walgreens and Safeway to put a TSPU in CVS stores? Um, like all of our retail partner conversations have changed over time. I think in <coughs> the earliest time frame, my memory is that we were actually talking about using the TSPU in their Minute Clinic because they had a lot of point of care technology in their Minute Clinic and that that was what they specifically were interested in. It, it changed later. Okay, so what did it change to later? Um, ultimately, we were discussing a lease model um, in which we would build out spaces within their stores. And, and there was iterations of that in the meantime. Who are your contacts at CVS? So I, I did not have the majority of direct contact with them. My memory is that at least um, at the in our last contacts with them was one of the principals who was uh, engaged, I think, most directly with Sunny, um, but I, I don't, I don't know by memory all the people who were involved. Um, I, I had a little bit of contact with toward the end of um, the engagement that we had with them. Oh, you just said the end of the engagement. Did the engagement end? Uh, just the <coughs> interactions. We were interacting around building a, a CLIA certified lab um, collection center uh, in their stores. We, uh, we may very well be interacting with them again. Uh, okay. uh, did, has Theranos entered into a contract with CVS? Not to my knowledge. Okay, and so when you just said the end of the engagement or the end of the discussions, when did the most recent discussions end? I believe um, in mid last year, but I'm, I'm not completely sure. What happened? We ended up uh, receiving, I think it was a notification of sanctions from CMS and trying to work through those issues and then decided to exit the clinical lab business. So did you terminate the discussions or did CVS terminate? I, I think the last email was keep us posted and we our, our plan has been to re-engage around what we're trying to do right now with Minilab. So the last email was from CVS saying, please keep us posted. To I, don't, you. I don't know what the last email was. OK. Yeah. So you have no idea I, uh, either way. It's, what? it's my understanding that that's where it was left, and, and it's my understanding on, on good terms. OK, so I want to change topics again. <laughs> How did you keep yourself apprised of the financial condition of the company? I, I trusted Sunny to run it in, from a, a cash management perspective. Would you get updates on how much in revenues the company was making? Not in revenues. Um, we were generally focused on tracking our cash balance internally, and I would get updates on that. Okay. How often would you get updates on your cash balance? Uh, I'm, I'm sure it changed over the years, um, but at some periodic frequency. I don't know specifically what the frequency was. Do you think it was, you know, every, did you ask her for updates every week or every month? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, it, was, it was at some recurring frequency. Um, oh. <coughs> I mean, you wouldn't go for a year without asking for the, the cash balance, right? No. So no. do you think you would ask her maybe every month or every couple months? Something like that. It, it's my memory that I asked her to send it at, at a recurring interval, like monthly. I don't know if it was monthly, but something like that. And did you apprise the board of the company's financial condition? We generally tracked our cash balance and then would talk about what we thought our potential was in terms of 
what we were working to do. Did you ever provide financial statements to the board that included, you know, both historical financials or financial projections? Not financial statements in the way that we're working to put them together now, uh, but we would share essentially what our cash balance was and what we, you know, models that would essentially have a series of assumptions on what we thought we could do in terms of uh, potential revenue. And if we'd received payments, you know, payments we'd received. Who would prepare those financial documents that you would present to the board? Uh, well, just to be clear, I, I did not present financial documents to the board. Sonny always presented financial documents to the board, um, and, and he would prepare the documents that he presented. Okay, so there was never a time in the company's existence when you presented financial information to your board? Not that I can remember. In, in preparation for those board meetings, would you go over Sonny's proposed presentation uh, sort of as like a, a, dr a dry run before presenting it to the board? We wouldn't do a dry run. Generally, a few minutes before the board meeting, he would show me what he was going to be presenting, um, but I, I don't know that that happened every time. As a general matter, whether before the board meeting or during the board meeting, you paid attention to the financial information that was being presented about the company? Yes. Were there also times when prospective investors would ask to see the financials for the company? Um, I, I can't remember a specific conversation in which they asked for financials, but I'm sure I'm sure there were investors who asked for financials at different points in time. Do, do you recall providing financials to prospective investors? I, I don't think so. We, we didn't have audited financials for a period of time. Okay, if not audited financials, do you remember providing unaudited financials to prospective investors? I, I think we generally provided projections and I know we generally communicated about receipt of the payments that we'd gotten from retailers uh, and, and where our cash balance was. Okay. Uh, so who was involved in putting together the financial projections that went to investors? Sunny. Did you have any involvement in that? I, I saw what was in at least written material that we shared um, and, and I, as we discussed the other day, generally understood that it was based on what we thought we could realize with the retail footprints that we thought we could build out. Did you agree with Sunny's financial projections of the company that you were showing to investors? Uh, I mean, I, I don't, he had a lot of different models that he would create based on how things were evolving. I think generally the assumption that we could hit a certain footprint was something that I believed was possible. And, you know, if you had any problems with the assumptions or how the model was being built, would you discuss that with Sonny? Yes, but I, I generally deferred to him in this area. Can you recall an instance in which you did discuss with him uh, revising the model to be more in line with assumptions that you thought were appropriate? I, I don't know that I was ever um, setting the assumptions for the model. I, I remember in the context of board discussions generally that he would share what the assumptions were and they seemed reasonable um, just in terms of, again, the retail footprint. So I guess I'm trying to put myself in your, uh, trying to understand your perspective as the CEO of the yeah. company at the time. What, was, was the financial condition of the company something, I, I understand your testimony to be that you generally deferred to him on preparation of the, the, the projections. Was it an area that you'd hoped to learn more about or get more involved in over time? My, my thinking was that if I had someone who knew how to do this well, I could defer that to that person and that where I should really spend time in the company is on what our board would always call my comparative advantage, which was inventing and sort of the strategy and the vision for how this could be rolled out. And, and what gave you the belief that Sonny Balwani was um, a good fit for, for, for preparing the, these financial projections? He was very confident in his ability to do it. Um, as I understood it, he had successfully built and sold his own company, and um, therefore I thought he was qualified to, to do it. I, I guess, did he, ever, did he ever explain anything you, to you about his experience, um, you know, growing it? growing and selling that prior company that would relate specifically to the 
creation of financial projections? Uh, no, but he understood Excel really well, and he seemed to be good at creating models, and I didn't have experience or any background in that, so I, I just deferred to him. So you mentioned earlier that you did see the financial projections that Sonny would send out to investors. Did you ever send out financial projections to investors directly? To be clear, I, I don't know that I saw all of them, because um, he did have a, a lot of contact with investors after I would meet them initially. Um, I don't know if they ever came from my email account. They, they might have. They would have been documents that he prepared for that purpose. Would you prepare? Uh, in those instances in which you would be sending out the financial projections directly, would you review them prior to sending them out? I, I, I don't have specific memory of the situation in which I was sending them out, so I, I don't know if I had reviewed it beforehand. I, I would think that what we would send would be generally consistent with sort of assumptions that I would believe in in, in terms of, uh, again, the retail footprint. Is it generally your practice to review documents that you're attaching to emails when you're sending them out to anyone in the company or outside of the company? I, I think it depends on what it is. If I'm, if I'm just forwarding something that has already been reviewed by a team of people, not necessarily. If I'm, uh, I'm creating content myself, clearly. If, if it's something I've never seen before and I'm sending, maybe I, I would need to look at a specific example. I guess, I guess you know, turning back to the 2014 time frame, uh, you know, who at Theranos had the ultimate sort of final say on the company's financial projections? Sonny did. And, and who had ultimate final authority on in terms of uh, when and how to recognize revenue? I, I, I don't know that we were really ever recognizing revenue in a gap way. I mean, we've brought Alvarez and Marcel in over the course of the last year to help us build systems to do this right. We were really focused on cash accounting and would generally describe payments as they were received, but um, Sonny would figure out how they should be reflected in the models that we were building. What, what about, I mean, what about just on the books of the company? Who had, who had ultimate decision in terms of whether something could be treated as cash that could be used for, uh, for operations? I, I, between Sonny and they would have made that decision. So what was the purpose of you reviewing the cash balance of the company? I mean, as a young company, we were just trying to make sure that we had enough cash. We were investing a lot in R&D and operations and hiring people and <coughs> wanted to get ready for these rollouts and launches and uh, needed to make sure that we weren't going to have to either change our operations or that we were going to run out of cash. So, so you needed to generally make sure that you know the, the company was running smoothly, that cash was going where it needed to be going, and that there was enough cash actually to run the business. Is that right? I, I, I was mostly making sure that there was enough cash to run the business, yes. I, I wouldn't say that I was necessarily the one managing where cash was going within the business. Who was managing where cash was going in the business? We didn't have formal budgeting in place, um, but um, the purchase order system reported in through Sonny and he saw um, all the POs that were going through the system. What about employee salaries? Who was reviewing that and making sure that the, there was enough cash to pay your employees? Um, the employee salaries were set based on compensation recommendations from whoever we had working in HR and then we were monitoring that based on what the cash balance was. Uh, who's we? Uh, myself, uh, Sunny. Okay, and who, was, who would be um, approving the compensation recommendations that you were being given? Who would have the ultimate say over that? I, I think it depends on the period of time early on. I would review and interview everybody, then later I didn't, and um, Sunny did. I think ultimately he may even have stopped interviewing and reviewing everyone and delegated some of that. I don't know when that happened. Did you review projections, financial projections that were sent to Rupert Murdoch? I, I've seen them. I guess before they were sent out to Mr. Murdoch, did you review those projections? 
I don't remember, um, but I've I've seen the documents in that binder. Did you review them with Mr. Murdoch in any of your meetings with him, or something similar to the document that was sent? I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure. What about with the capital? Did you review financial projections uh, that were sent to capital at the time they were sent? I remember that when we asked them to work as an advisor to us, was actually helping us to build a model. Um, I don't know if I reviewed what was sent to them beforehand. I remember, <coughs> I remember that they were working on creating one for us. W was that your understanding of part of what the purpose of the engagement was, was to help build a financial model? <laughs> In the beginning, yes. As, as we discussed, it changed over time. Do you know if the company ever used the model that was, if, if one was provided? I think that we used parts of it. I don't know that we used all of it. And, and was that your understanding at the time those discussions were taking place as well, or is that just what you've come to understand now? It's what I've come to understand now. Do you have any understanding, you know, back in the 2014 time period of, of how the company was using the information it was getting from? I, I don't. I don't. Who would know that? I, I would talk to Sonny about it. What about uh, P, uh, PFM, Partner Fund Management? Did you review financial projections that went out to them at the time that they were sent? I, I don't think I did. I, I think it, my, my current understanding is that um, they had asked for some information from Sonny to build their own model, and he sent information to them that he thought would be useful for that. So you're not a you're not you don't remember um, either reviewing or receiving those projections before they were sent to PFM. I don't. In the fall of 2014, did you believe that Theranos would be able to exceed 100 million dollars in revenues by year end? So I don't remember what I thought then, um, but um, I, I, I don't remember what I thought then. What about, um, did, did you have any understanding of whether in, um, let's write that, let me just start over again. Uh, in August 2014, did you believe that Theranos would break even by year end? Again, I, I don't remember what I thought at that time. I, I look back on how we were thinking about growth based on retail footprint, and that if we could hit a certain number of locations, we would see a certain number, of, a certain amount of revenue. What does break even mean to you? Uh, that we are getting as much cash into the company as cash going out of the company. I guess, do you have any re recollection from August 2014 through the end of that year about whether you thought the company was going to break even in 2014? I, I, can't, I can't remember where my head was in those months. You know, it was a long time ago. I, I'm not sure. W was that a concern of yours at the time? In 2014, whether we were going to break even? Right. Um, I, I think at that time I was more concerned about how fast can we roll out the retail footprint and how quickly can we start that ramp. Um, and, and I believed that the revenue and, and cash inflow would come from that. Why were you focused on the uh, rollout of the Theranos wellness centers at that time? Why was that important to you? It was my understanding that our revenue streams were based around that. So if we could hit a certain footprint, then we would see both people coming in to the stores as well as associated revenue from other services that we could provide. What is that associated revenue? Uh, we thought we would be able to, in a geography that we were in, see revenue from samples coming from physician offices and hospitals and also begin to provide pharmaceutical trials around the retail footprint. This was in, this was in kind of that fall 2014 period you had that belief? I, I think we always thought, I mean, going back to when we put the contracts in place, that you could build um, 
services like the pharma studies around the retail footprint. I, I guess in the fall, so by that point in the fall of 2014, Theranos had a retail footprint in Arizona, right? We did. Uh, had it done anything to build out a, a, a pharma trials, you know, tr trial business in, in Arizona at that time? Walgreens had a team that was focused on engaging with pharmaceutical companies to do clinical studies through the stores. And as I understood it, there I don't know if it was at that time specifically, but there was a lot of very positive engagement with those companies to run the clinical trials. Okay, but it, it was, was it still sort of in the, in the concept stage rather than the actually, offers, actually offering services stage? The way I've always thought about it is that it was triggered by how many stores we had. And so if we had a bigger footprint, then we would be able to run these studies. And so what, in, in your mind, what was the sort of the the minimum number of stores that Theranos would need to have in a given geography to, um, to run those studies? I, I don't know if I ever thought of it as having a minimum number. I think it was more that you would need to be ramping up rollout. I mean, the 41 number that we sort of plateaued at um, was always associated with what was initially a pilot, and we never really ramped beyond that. So it was when we were getting into this national ramp we thought we were going to do. As, I, I guess so. As, as long as as long as Theranos was just in those forty one stores, you didn't have any expectation that it was going to gain any money, uh, gain any revenue from these pharma services associated revenue kind of stream. Is that is that fair? No, I mean both from our previous work with pharma's as well as the engagement that Walgreens had with them, we thought that, you know, for example, you could use it as a site to enroll people, but. We were, so far as projections are concerned, really looking at the ramp as sort of the trigger for realizing sort of the multiple streams of revenue that we were thinking about. Yeah, I guess I, setting, aside, setting aside the projections just as a matter of, you know, if this concept of thinking about uh, ramping up Walgreens. Sure. Did you, did you, did you think you were going to have any, you know, pharmaceutical services business? If, if, if Theranos was just in the 41 stores? I, I, I don't think we thought that we were going to just be in 41 stores. I think we thought that we were always about to ramp. I don't think we were thinking about we're just going to be in 41 stores. You, you also mentioned just a minute ago the sort of the prior work that Theranos had done with those uh, pharmaceutical partners or partners like GSK and Sharing Plow. Is that, is that what you had in mind there? Um, I was specifically, as I said that, I was thinking about um, the opportunities that existed to do new programs based on some of the people within those pharma companies who had expressed interest based on the success of the initial programs. Did, did you discuss with anyone at Walgreens the concept that Theranos would be the service provider for their pharma relationships in these clinical trials? And just to answer the question best, what do you mean by service provider? Well, how is it that y you alluded to Walgreens having relationships with pharmaceuticals sure. and that Theranos would earn money from that? I'm just yes. trying to ask, how, how is that supposed to work and who did you discuss that with Walgreens? Yes, yes. Um, so specifically, the concept was that you allow people who walk into retail to enroll in a clinical trial for a pharmaceutical study. They then would have a lab order. It's not a physician-directed lab order, but <coughs> for an investigational use. And they would get their sample uh, collected at Walgreens for the purpose of the trial. And then the pharma company could use that for their clinical trial. So the concept was you're going to use the stores as sites. And that was something that we discussed way back into 2010 and the original agreement. From the time of Theranos's inception until the present, has Theranos ever achieved break-even status? I don't think so. Was there a time when Theranos engaged a company called Aranka to prepare a 409A report to value the company's common stock? Yes. And did you provide financial information uh, to Aranka for that purpose? Um, I, I think so, yes. Was it your intent? And just to be clear, by you, you mean Theranos, or you mean me personally? I meant you. Oh, I, I don't think I personally did, no. Okay. Who did? Um, I think... Did you approve the financial information that she provided to Aranka? Um, in some cases, I think so. 
was it your intent to provide accurate information to Aranka for the purpose of valuing the company's common stock? <coughs> um, to the extent we were using it for issuing options, yes. We, we also used Aranka for other purposes as we worked to develop our own internal valuation models. Okay, so I just asked you whether it was your intent to provide accurate information to Aranka. Are you saying that for other purposes it wasn't your intent to provide accurate information? I know there were some instances in which we would hold financial models constant to look at the impact of certain events like the financings uh, on the stock price. We were not using those reports as 409As in the traditional sense, but we were using them as an uh, external valuation methodology that we could then build our own internal model from. Why use a 409A report as the, to, for that purpose? Um, we'd received guidance that if we were to try to structure ourselves as a private company and um, build our own model for valuing our stock, it would be useful to have a reference method that was done by a third party that we could use in forming our own model. Sure, but why, why, uh, why not hire a, a valuation firm to do that work? Um, the specific guidance that we'd gotten was to have this firm that had been working with us and already built models for um, understanding how they valued our stock to continue, but just look at the differential impact of the financing events on the value of the stock that they'd previously established. Who, who gave you that advice? Um, that, that may raise privilege issues, but... I, 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 to the extent it's yeah. not an attorney, I guess, is, you know, is, 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 you know, looking back at that time was... was just, so just tell me if there was a, if there was a non-attorney or non-attorneys who gave that advice, you can identify them, but nothing else. <clears throat> and you could say yes or no to that, if, were there non-attorneys? Yeah, and I, I, it, it was discussed by our attorney with our board, but it was an attorney who... Okay, so th uh, did any of the non-attorney board members express any concerns about using a 409A evaluation <coughs> for the purpose you just described? There was some confusion about it, and we discussed that too in uh, at least one of our board meetings. I guess, what, what, do, you, what do you mean by confusion? Um, that we were using the model for the purpose of developing an internal valuation method and that that was why we were holding our projections constant in that version of the model while we were sharing with our board the projections that we hoped to be able to achieve. Who, who expressed that confusion? Uh, Dick Kovacevic. Anyone else? Not that I can remember. Others might have. He, he was the most vocal in the board meeting in which this was discussed. Did you ever tell Aranka that you were using their valuation report for the purpose you just described? I don't know. And just to clarify, yeah. when you say internal valuation model, are you saying that someone internally was actually taking their reports and then <coughs> putting them into a model that, that the company then owned? Just trying to understand what you mean by internal valuation. Yes. Um, so we, we believed that we were going to structure ourselves as a private company. I was learning about and trying to model some of that off of the guidance that I'd received from Riley Bechtel about how they value their stock. They have an internal valuation model to value their stock. We thought that we would try to build one too, and we actually thought that ultimately it would be great to have the common stock and the preferred stock price be the same so that we could stay as a private company. Um, and so the question was, how do we build an internal model? And the um, process that was agreed upon was to have some third party um, do continue to do valuations over a period of time so that, for example, it wouldn't be just us saying that if you raised a material amount of money, it impacted your um, stock price in this way, you could refer back to um, this is a reference source for how you were building the model and the algorithm. I, I don't think we ended up getting very far uh, down that path. So did anyone build an internal valuation model? I guess it's really my question. I, I don't know. Who, who was taking that on? Um, I, I don't know that we, I mean, had we done it, it would have been sunny. I don't know that it started because we were <coughs> just beginning to go down creating sort of the framework for that. 
Maybe I missed something, yeah. but um, so are, why would the projections uh, in your internal model be different from uh, the, the projections you'd be giving Arapa in order to value the, the common stock of the company? As of a certain period of time when we stopped issuing options, we were trying to understand how much the impact of a certain financing transaction would have on the common stock price if all else were the same. Okay, so when did you stop issuing stock options? I think it was in December of 2013. Okay, so uh, from 2014 onwards, were you then sending these sort of um, sort of altered projections to Aranka in order to um, provide information for this internal model? I, I think so. I don't know exactly about every interaction with Aranka, but I know that that was happening after that period of time. Did you tell you were planning on using the Aranka reports for this purpose after the end of 2013? I don't know. Do you know if Sunny did? I don't. Do you think she, th that's something that would have been helpful for her to know? <coughs> I don't know. I, I, I don't know very much about her interactions with Aranko overall. So I'm going to hand to you what's been marked. Theranos is at 226. <coughs> Is that at 226 purports to be a document titled Theranos Inc. FMV of Common Stock as of March 25th, 2015. Um, the date of the report is actually April 6, 2015, and the starting base number is TS-001. Uh, TS-0021981. Have you seen Exhibit 226 before? Um, I, I don't have memory of it, but I, I recognize it as an Aranka report. <clears throat> okay, I'll represent to you that this uh, document was a part of the April 15th, 2015 board meeting binder that Theron has produced to the SEC pursuant to subpoena. So, if you turn to uh, being a member of the board, would you have reviewed this as part of the board uh, meeting binder materials? I definitely would have received it. I don't remember if we reviewed it. Okay. Who who would have would would, would anyone have presented the Iraq report at the meeting? I don't think so. Why not? I'm, I'm trying to remember if we ever had presentations of the Iraq reports. I I think they were included in the binders. I don't think that anybody ever presented on them. Would you have reviewed uh, this report prior to having it included in the board binder? Probably not. Who would have, maybe we should talk generally about yeah. who actually collects documents and puts them in these board binders? Hi, at what period of time? Did it change? Yes, we have a very different system in place now. Uh, okay, so I'm not talking about now. Yeah. So from the 2013 to 2014 period, who was in charge of doing that? Um, I, I, I don't know specifically. I, it, it, was a, it was a pretty informal process where I don't think we ever really circulated materials in advance. They were put together right before the meetings. So you don't know who would have put together the materials before the meeting? I, I don't. I, I, I can guess. I, I don't. Aren't you the chair of the board? I am. So <coughs> you had no knowledge as to how these board binders were being put together? I'm sure I did then. I just don't remember in the end of 2013 what group of people was doing it. Okay. And as chair of the board, would you have reviewed the materials prior to handing them out to board members? Generally, yes. I, I don't know that I specifically read these reports. I, I don't think I did. Why don't you think you did? Like, uh, what's the basis for that answer? <coughs> because I don't think I've, I've ever <laughs> actually read one of these reports end to end.
Okay, if you turn to 22034. <coughs> Zero, three, four. Yes. You'll see that there is a page in here with historical financials, and on this particular page, uh, it's the income statement. And you'll see there's a revenue line. It looks like in December 2011, as of December 2011, uh, or, or for a uh, period ending December 2011, Theranos made 518,000 in revenues. And then there were no revenues in 2012 and 2013, and then 150,000 um, in 2014. Is that consistent with your understanding of the revenues that Theranos made in those years? I, I don't know what the actual revenues were in those years. You didn't keep, keep track at all of what Theranos was earning in revenues? I, I did not personally know. Did, did never provide you with any updates as to what the company was generating in revenues? We weren't really focused on revenue. We were focused on cash management and retail rollout. Do you have any reason to question um, whether Theranos generated $150,000 in revenue in 2014? I, I don't know what this is based on. I, I wouldn't know what to question. I, I guess in that, you know, a minute ago you said, you know, by, by this time, uh, the Iraq reports were being used for a different purpose. Is that right? Yes. And um, and so what you were doing was keeping the projections of, of, of future revenue constant with uh, over time to help build the valuation model, right? Generally, uh, as I understand it, yes. Did, did, did you ever intend to keep the company's income statement stagnant as well to help develop a valuation model? I, I don't know what was done with that. I, I guess, did, in your mind, back at the time, did you have any, any reason why the income statement should remain stagnant or constant or unchanged um, to, to help that valuation process you described? I, I don't know if I've, I've ever thought about it. I, I don't know. I, I don't think this is something that, that I've looked at before. I, in terms of what the right way to handle that in the model is, I, I know there was discussions about that with respect to projections. I'm, I'm not aware of conversations about that with respect to the income statement one way or the other. So you said you were focused on cash, not revenue, right? Correct. Is that true for 2011 through 2014? Yes. So how was the company getting cash, if not through revenue? Um, we received these, what we were previously calling exclusivity payments, from the retailers. And um, then in the end of 13, early 14, raised equity capital. And who did you receive the exclusivity payments from? Those are the Walgreens and the Safeway payments. Are those reflected here? I don't know. What was the amount of those payments? I think Walgreens paid us in total $140 million, including the convertible note that they had. And um, Safeway paid us, I think, $30 million. And what year were those payments made? Um, I know the $75 million from Walgreens was in December of 13. The $25 million was before that. I don't know when the $40 million note was. Um, and the Safeway payments, I, I think we're in the 11 or 12 time frame. Okay, so if you turn to 22009, <coughs> which is actually earlier in the document, <coughs> You'll see there's an income statement here as well, but it looks like this is uh, a I'm projected... Sorry. I just also wanted to add to the answer to your question. I, I, I know we also received those payments from insurance companies, uh, and I'm not sure if it was during that time frame. <coughs> what do you mean by payments from insurance companies? Um, from certain Blue Cross Blue Shield plans. Were those payments for testing that was done? No. Um, they were the same type of upfront payments. Okay, so looking at 22009, there's an income statement, it looks like. It includes uh, financial projections for the years ended December 2015 to 2018. Do you see that? Yes. 
and actually it also includes a 10-month projection, or I think this is... Um, that covers the 10-month period. It covers the 10-month period um, uh, for 2015. Do you see that as well? Yes. Okay. Um, so you'll see, uh, you know, for 2015 to 2018, roughly, uh, you're projecting here to generate about 113 million in 2015, 2000, uh, 223 million in 2016, 323 million in 2017, and 503 million in 2018. Did you approve of those financial projections that they be provided to Aranka? I don't know. You can keep that in front of you for the moment. <clears throat> I'm handing to you what's already been marked as uh, Theranus Exhibit 160. Exhibit 160 purports to be a December 23rd, 2014 email from Elizabeth Holmes to subject line read 409A with a starting base number THPFM 00008898870. Have you seen Exhibit 160 before? I, I don't remember it, but I, I recognize <coughs> my email here. Okay, so you'll see about halfway down the page there's an email from to you, and she's saying that she sent over projections to Ronka the night before um, because they have a deadline before the end of the year. And then she writes, I use the same assumptions for revenue as in October, roughly 100 million, 200 million, 300 million, and 500 million in 2015 through 2018. Do you see that? I do. And then you respond back to her and you say 100 million for 15, right? So you're questioning whether or not. Um, uh, you're, you're confirming with her that it's $100 million for 2015. Do you see that? I do. And then she confirms, yes, that's, that's correct. And then you say, thanks. So does that refresh your recollection that you approved of these financial projections that were in this April 2015 report to Aranka? It, it doesn't refresh my recollection, but I, I don't have reason to doubt this email. What did you base these projections on, the 100, 200, 300, and 500 million? I, I don't know. Did you have a financial model that you were working with? I, I'm assuming that since she says the same assumptions, this is based on something else. I don't know what it was. You, you think it was based on something else that you had worked on? I, I don't know. <coughs> so you have no idea uh, how, how she came up or you came up with 100 200, 300, and 500 million for those years? I don't, and I, I don't know what we were using this report for at that time. Did you think to ask her a question? Why, what is the purpose of this report? What was, how were you responding back to her and approving of the projections if you didn't know what the purpose of the report was? I, I, I can't remember now what the purpose of the report was. I'm assuming at that time I had some understanding of what the purpose of the report was. I just can't remember what it was. Are you aware of a financial model somewhere that would have projected these revenue figures for 2015 to 2015, uh, 2015 to 2018? I, again, I don't know, and I didn't maintain those models, um, and I don't even know that this necessarily would have been consistent with any models that we were maintaining um, on assumptions for retail rollout. Who was maintaining those assumptions? Sonny was. So if I understand, by, by this time period, um, in, 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 to the best of your memory, Aranka was being used to help um, help build an internal valuation model. Is, is that fair? They were. And, and, and I think you said the goal was to have the value of the common stock be um, on par with the preferred at some point in time. To ultimately get to that point. I realize it's a long ramp, but yes. th that, that was the goal you had in mind, right? That was what we thought the end, end objective was. Yeah, and that was important to your goal of ultimately staying a private company in the long term. Yes, and continuing to restructure ourselves as a private company. The, is it fair to say that the, 
the company's valuation was something that was important to you in this time frame? Generally, yes. Why was that? Because it's important to our shareholders. And, and, and did shareholders from time to time, you know, people who invested earlier, whether when you first started or in 2010, ask for copies of uh, Arancas 409A reports? Not to my knowledge. D did anyone ever communicate to you that uh, an inv a, a prior investor has, has asked for a 409A report? And sitting here now, I can't remember any. It's possible that they did. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I guess if your ultimate goal is to, to have common stock and be on, be on par value with the, with the preferred uh, and, and valuation of the company, something that's important to you, I'm trying to understand why you never read one of these Iraq reports cover to cover. So we began the process of structuring as a private company in the end of 13, and um, we assumed this was going to be a long multi-year process and that these were just the first steps in beginning to develop a formula for what the impact of capital infusion was on some of the, these metrics around common stock price. I, I was not um, primarily focused on the finance aspects of our business. I trusted that if this was what really smart people that we were paying a lot of money to <coughs> thought was a good idea to do, that that's what we would do, and that at the time we would start building these models internally, I would look at it and learn about it. I, I don't have specific background in this area, and so it wasn't something that I was focused on. Did, did you track the Aranka's, so you mentioned you, know, you wanted these reports <coughs> to see how the, the equity events impacted the common stock value. Mm -hmm. did, did you track those final <coughs> numbers as they came in from report to report? I don't think so. Do you know if, who the, if anyone at the company did? I, I don't know that we even started this. I think we were just trying to get the information at this point and have it, and that it would ultimately be used uh, for the purpose of an internal model. I'm handing to you what's been marked, <coughs> Theranos Exhibit 227. And actually, you can keep the Aranda report in front of you. <coughs> Exhibit 227 purports to be uh, a spreadsheet, the first right, page. I, if, I'm sorry, I just wanted to clarify. I, I can't remember any instance in which someone asked for a copy of a 409A, but it's it's possible over all the years that, that they did. Um, I, is it something that, that you think Fairness would have shared with its investors? I, I don't think that we did that generally. It's, it's possible that it's some instance we did, but I, I don't think, certainly it wasn't routine that I know about. And I guess why why wouldn't the company generally share share these reports? I, I think we saw it as an internal tool um, for a very specific purpose, which was initially valuation of options and then development of our own model. In in general, but there's so many years and so many interactions that I I may just not be remembering something. So Exhibit Two Twenty Seven purports to be. Um, Financial statements. The first uh, page is titled "Pro Forma Projected Statement of Income with Starting Base Number TS-0021911." Have you seen Exhibit 227 before? Just, just, just to, I mean, just to be clear for the record, I, I don't think these purport to be financial statements. I mean, they say what they say on the top of them, but in the past, when you said that, it's been like a, an email. Please don't. Say financial statements on them, do they? Sure. So, Exhibit 227 purports to be a document titled Pro Forma Projected Statement of Income. I, I don't know if I've seen it before. So, I'll represent to you that this document was part of the April 15th, 2015 board meeting uh, materials that Theranos produced to the SEC pursuant to subpoena. So it was presented at the same time as um, Exhibit 225. Oh, sorry, is that wrong? 226. It was presented at the same time as Exhibit 226. To the board? To the board. Okay. So you'll see that. Uh, 
there is a projected statement of income, a pro forma and projected statement of income. There's a pro forma statement of cash flow and a consolidated balance sheet here. Did you review this at the time of the board meeting? I don't know. Do you recognize this format generally? I mean, whether or not you recall this specific document. Uh, does the format of Exhibit 227 look like the kind of um, projected statements of income, projected uh, pro forma statements of cash flow and, and balance sheets that the company maintained? Um, it, it's actually different than what I had remembered sharing. Um, the, the, the Murdoch projections that you showed me the other day um, in format, I think, um, but I, I don't have reason to doubt <coughs> it. Who prepared these financial statements? Sonny. So if you look at <coughs> the revenues for the period ending 2014, this is on the first page in the statement of income, you'll see that Total revenue is projected um, to be, uh, or not projected actually, because this is in 2015, but total revenue for the year was $108 million. Do you see that? I do. What was the basis for this number? I think it was he was believing that the Walgreens payment could be earned within the 2014 time frame, and then there was some uh, retail revenue uh, as well that was associated with that. I don't know if he also thought that some of the Safeway payment could have been earned, I'm not sure. What's your basis for that, for your understanding of, I guess, what, what he believed? Because I remember conversations with him in which he would talk about the fact that we'd earned the Walgreens payment. What, when do you recall those conversations taking place? Um, on an ongoing basis, uh, certainly by this 2015 time period that you're talking about. So you mentioned there were three different components that you thought might go into this. There's the Walgreens um, payments, $75 million innovation fee payment. There is the Safeway payment. When was that made? So I, just to be clear, I, I think that by 2015, this number was based on thinking that, for whatever reason, the $100 million from Walgreens was in this time period. Um, the hundred million from Walgreens. I think so. When was the twenty-five million initial payment from Walgreens? When when did that come into the company? I, I don't know, but I know it was before December of twenty thirteen. Okay, so why would that be included in the revenues for two thousand fourteen? You, you'd have to ask him. I don't know. And then you said the remaining amount of revenues would have come from the retail business. Is this the retail pharmacy business? I, I think so. Yes. Okay, so um, if, if we're, uh, I'm sorry, and I think, I don't know if you answered the, my question about the Safeway payment. When, when did the Safeway, pay, the Safeway payment come in? I, I don't know. I believe it was before 2013. Okay, and, and how much was that payment? I, I think it was $30 million, but I, I think there was a $25 million and a $5 million component. I, I don't know how he treated the five. So if we add up the $100 million that you think Sonny might have put into this plus an additional 30, that's already $130 million. So I, I, what I, is, what I don't is, know. So what's the basis for your belief as to how he came up with this $108 million figure? That he was treating the payments received from retailers, I, I believe at least Walgreens, uh, in this number, plus some retail services revenue, and I don't know how he was treating that $5 million from Safeway. Uh, why do you think there was such a difference between what we saw in the Aronka report, which had 2014 actual revenues as 150000 and um, here you're seeing revenues for $108 million? Why was there such a difference between the two? I, I don't know. I, I think this was in the context of discussion about the fact that we thought that we'd earned the Walgreens payment. Um, I don't know what the basis for the income statement in the Aronka document is.
Did you ever represent to prospective investors in 2015 that Theranos generated over $100 million in revenues in 2014? I, I don't think we generally talked about <coughs> historical revenues very much. I, I know we openly talked about having received $100 million from Walgreens and also the other payments from, uh, from Safeway and probably the insurance companies as well because we thought that showed the, the interest and commitment of our partners. Do you recall a meeting with Sutter Health in August 2015 during which you showed their financials for the company? Do you recall that meeting? I, I remember meeting with him. I, I don't know when it was. Okay, but do you remember a meeting in which you showed him financial information for the company? Um, I, I'm, I'm trying to remember if I remember showing him financial information. I'm, I'm not sure. Do you remember showing him statements, financial statements, that indicated Theranos was making or had made $108 million in 2014? and was projected to make $240 million in 2015 and another $750 million in 2016? I, I don't remember those numbers, but if those were numbers we discussed, they would have been based on whatever our internal models were at the time. What do you mean by based on whatever internal models? This type were. of understanding <coughs> of the payments that we'd received and what we thought we could achieve in terms of retail footprint. So you mean that you would have been relying on whatever financial models Sunny Balwani was working on? Absolutely. They're not paid taxes, right? Yes. Uh, and and you know, we're, we're involved in the process of, uh, of, of signing off on Theranos' tax returns at different points in time. <clears throat> I, I don't know if my signature was required on a document. I would have signed it, but I, I wasn't involved in a detailed way. Do you have any understanding of what Theranos reported to the IRS in terms of revenues in 2014? I do not. How about 2013? I do not. Did you at the time? If I signed the tax returns, I would have. I, I can't remember. You wouldn't provide inaccurate information to the IRS, would you? No. I guess, is there any reason for the revenue that Theranos was reporting to the IRS to be different from the revenue figure shared with Sutter Health? I, I don't know. I, I think to the extent we were making projections, we were talking about what we thought could be done with payments that had been received. I, I don't know if from, I mean, I'm, I'm speculating from a government reporting standpoint, if we weren't completely sure yet whether they could be recognized or not. I, I know we were transparent about what those payments were and that there were these monies that had been received from retail partners. I, I, I guess, w w what do you mean by you, you, you remember that we were transparent about? Uh, we, we thought that the fact that <coughs> Walgreens had paid us 100 million and another 40 in the note and Safeway had paid us 30 was one of the most validating pieces of information we could share. So openly communicating that was a way of communicating that we thought we had a real opportunity to roll out at retail. Everybody knew we were only in 41 stores and that we were trying to see, you know, I, I thought, 10 patients a day. I, we, were, we were very open about that. In, in other words, you viewed not only just the, the existence of the Walgreens relationship, the Walgreens' financial commitment as a, as a sign of faith in, in, in Theranos? Absolutely. And, and that's a sign of faith you wanted to share with the best? Yes. Did you tell investors that the $108 million or $100 million that were generated in revenues in 2014, that that was made up of payments that were coming in from Walgreens and Safeway? So I, I don't know if this was ever shared with investors, but I, I know that, again, we openly talked about the $100 million from Walgreens being a payment for exclusivity. Do you remember telling Consider Health that the 108 million consisted of payments that were coming from Walgreens and Safeway? I don't remember that conversation very well. I mean, again, at that time, we still would have been only in 41 stores, so we were very open about what we were trying to do at, at retail. Hey, so it's 1 o'clock. Want to take a lunch break? 
<clears throat> sure, we can take a lunch break. Um, we are off record at 1 p.m. This concludes media number two of Elizabeth Holmes. <clears throat> uh, 45 minutes again. Does that work? We are back on the record at the beginning of media number three of Elizabeth Holmes. The time is 1.55. Ms. Holmes, did you have any substantive conversations with the SEC staff during the break? Is that a no? Yes, Sorry. correct. Okay. <laughs> um, so we were talking before the lunch break about um, the financials of the company and yep. uh, what you knew about how they were maintained and and who was preparing them for prospective investors. Do you, do you remember that? I do. Okay. Do you recall providing financial information to prospective investors in late 2014, showing Theranos on the road to achieving over $100 million in revenues? I, I don't have specific memory of that, um, but I, I know we shared projections with investors in late 2014. Do you recall providing financial information in August 2014 that indicated that Theranos was projected to make $140 million in revenues for 2014? I don't remember that specifically. Do you recall providing financial information to Fremont Group in October 2014 that indicated that Theranos was on track to make $126 million in revenues for 2014? Again, I, I don't have specific memory of it. Do you recall providing financial information to the capital in October 2014 that indicated that Theranos was on track to make $125 million in revenues for 2014? No. So I'm going to hand to you. what's been previously marked as Theranos Exhibit 195. Exhibit 195 purports to be a, an October 13th, 2014 email from Sunny Balwani to, with a copy of Elizabeth Holmes and subject line is re-thanks. Uh, and the starting dates number is BDT SEC underscore PST 0004140. And there is an attachment with dates number ending 4142. Have you seen Exhibit 195 before? I, I don't recognize it, uh, but I don't have reason to doubt it. So you'll see here that Sunny Balwani is sending a financial model to Capital. Do you see that? I do. Uh, and the model is attached to the email. What was your <coughs> understanding as to how Mr. Balwani came up with the financial projections? I don't know. Did he send these to you prior to sending them out, Capital? I don't think so. I don't remember him doing that. Do you, do you recall discussing them with him before they were sent out to Capitol? No. You, you, you understand that you're copied on the e I just want to clarify one thing, that you're copied on the email that appears at 195. I, I just saw that, yeah. Did you review this attachment at the time that you received the email? I, I don't know. <coughs> so if you would turn to... the income statement, which is looks like four pages into the attachment, you'll see here that revenue for 2014 is projected to be $125 million in 2014. Do you see that? I do. Um, and you'll see that there's a breakout for the revenues in 2014, um, and actually only $30 million is coming from U.S. retail pharmacies. Do you see that? I do. Uh, so U.S. retail pharmacies, would that be capturing the Walgreens and Safeway revenues that you were looking to, to achieve? Um, it could be. I don't know what this was specifically in this model. You don't know what U.S. retail pharmacies is referring to? Uh, I, again, I, I don't remember going through any of the assumptions that went into this with Sunny, so I'm not sure exactly what he was referring to here. 
have you seen versions of the financial projections that um, that you were sending to uh, prospective investors that look similar to this? Um, as I as I said earlier, I had in my mind the format that was in the um, Murdoch binder documents that you showed me, um, but I. I, mean, I generally recognize this as a Theranos document. Okay, so you have no idea as to how Mr. Balwani was breaking out the revenue streams for, for instance, U.S. retail pharmacies, physician offices, and hospitals, or what those categories were supposed to include or consist of? I, I don't. I was just flipping back to the market assumptions page to look at what the assumptions were in here, um, which my, my assumption sitting here now would be that that's what this is based on. Okay, so if you look at the market assumptions page, <clears throat> it looks like for retail pharmacy, so if you look at the first page of the document, retail pharmacy, you've got revenue per requisition and then the fully loaded cost system in Rx. Um, if you turn the page you'll see that there are a number of assumptions related to the Walgreens and um, other retail pharmacy services. Do you see that? I do. Uh, I mean, is there, can you think of anything else that retail pharmacies could mean other than the Walgreens and possibly Safeway relationships? I, I, don't, I don't know what he was thinking when he was creating this model. Um, it looks here, just from reading this document sitting here, that he's assuming these are going to be Walgreens locations. Okay, so looking back at the income statement then, um, before our lunch break, you had testified earlier that you believe that Mr. Balwani arrived at over $100 million in revenues in 2014 because he, he had included the $75 million accelerated innovation fee payment there. Uh, um, Do you remember that testimony? I, what I was attempting to communicate was that the questions you were asking about the $108 million number and where it might have come from, I believed was associated with the Walgreens payment. Um, I commented that I'm not sure about how revenue should have been recognized. Okay, so here it doesn't look like that $75 million accelerated payment was included in Mr. Balwani's uh, projection for 2014. Do you see that? I do. So do you know what the basis was for uh, Mr. Balwani's projection of $125 million for 2014? I do not. I guess just looking at this, you know, these, these projected revenue sources, it looks, you know, $30 million about from, from retail pharmacies, which looking back looks like Walgreens. Uh, and then I think <coughs> we talked earlier about the associated revenue from physicians' offices, hospitals, and, and pharma services. Uh, in late 2014, was, was this your expectation about how, uh, you know, whether, you know, meeting the gross, the, the gross numbers or not, just the, sort of the breakdown of, you know, about a third from retail pharmacies, a tenth from uh, physicians' offices, a little more than a third from, uh, from hospitals. Was that, in your mind, how the how the revenue stream was going to look like? I, I never thought about it that way specifically. I thought about it in terms of number of retail stores and then assuming you had that footprint, what was a reasonable assumption of number of samples that could get sent to you by a given physician office or hospital group and how many of those was it reasonable to assume you could get in a given geography? I, 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 so in that sort of assumption um, sample mind frame. Did, did you did you assume that more samples were going to be run uh, from from hospital and pharma partners than were actually being run from the just the operational Walgreens re retail pharmacies? I I don't know. I, I don't know if I ever focused on what the differential would be between the two. I I remember looking at both the number of store assumption as well as is it reasonable to pick up a certain number of samples per day from <coughs> physician office groups and was it reasonable to get a certain number of physician office groups and focusing on that part of it. What revenues had the company realized 
from physicians' offices by this time in October 2014? I don't know. Was there any? I don't know. At, at some point, we started doing a pickup from physician offices. I don't know when it started. Did you have any contracts with physicians' offices at this time? I don't know. Um, as referenced, we had a sales team in Arizona that was working on putting contracts in place with groups. I, I don't know the dates on those contracts with physician groups. And would it surprise you if, you if Theranos had no contracts with physicians' offices during this time? I, I think generally, yes. I think we were, um, we believed that the relationships that we had in place uh, would give us the ability to realize the assumed number of physician offices. So I, I generally thought that we had the relationships that we needed to be able to put this footprint in place. Uh, what about from hospitals? Do you know how much in revenues Theranos had realized in revenues from hospitals uh, up until October 2014? I, I don't. I, unless we had been doing the same type of pickup that we had started doing in physician offices, in physician offices that were part of hospital groups, I don't think there was any other uh, financial uh, income from hospitals at that point in time. And do you know if Theranos was picking up samples from hospitals at this time? I don't. I don't know when we started the pickups. Did you start pickups with any hospital um, I, I, at any time? I, I'm hesitating just because I, I think the word hospital here was referring to health systems, and some of the physician groups that we were working with may have been part of uh, health systems. I, I don't know when those started and whether the physicians that we ultimately did that with were part of these health systems. Okay, but do you, do you remember Theranos ever starting to process samples from hospitals? Um, from physician groups that were affiliated with health systems, I, I believe we did. Okay, but, but not from hospitals themselves? Uh, so we were using, I, I think, the word hospital and health system interchangeably. Yeah, and so the, the group would have been associated with a hospital chain, as I understood it. What are some of those physician groups? So I think um, Commonwealth in Arizona was one of them, um, and there was another one, uh, I'm trying to remember, um, there was another health system group, I, I don't remember the name, uh, but I, I know that was something that very focused on in Arizona. So you recall there were two physicians groups that Theranos was processing samples for? I believe there were more than two, I just don't know what all of them were. <clears throat> I guess was this conflation of hospitals and health systems sort of like the normal language at Theranos at the time, or is this something you just come to understand and reading the document now? It's certainly something that I've come to understand now. I, I don't know at that time whether we use those words interchangeably. Okay. I, I guess, so do you know that that's what hospitals meant in this model? I, I don't know that. I'm assuming that. Based on your based on information you've gathered s since this time, yes. Who would know as to how much Theranos had realized in revenues from both physicians' offices and hospitals? As of October, as of 2014. October 2014. Um, I, I would ask Sonny. Sonny would know. I don't know if he knows, um, but I mean, if I were trying to find that out, and if I were still working with him, he'd be the first person that I would have asked. Who else besides Sonny would know? She would have known about um, what relationships we had in place with, with health systems or physician groups in Arizona. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't think she had um, engagement on any of the national health system groups. She was focused only on local groups. So there were other chains um, like Dignity and others that had a national presence that we were hopeful we would be able to ultimately engage with. Um, and she wouldn't have been involved, as I understand it, in interactions with them. Okay, and so who would have been responsible for those other relationships besides the Arizona ones? Sonny was. Okay, let's go down to um, then pharmaceutical services. Mm -hmm. 
What had Theranos realized in the pharmaceutical service space in terms of revenues for 2014 by this time? I, I don't know. I, I don't remember doing much on the pharmaceutical services side in 2014. Did you have any contracts in place with any pharmaceutical companies at this time? I, I don't know. I, I know that we had some relationships from our prior work that we were hopeful we were going to reconstitute. I don't know if there had been specific conversations with them or with the group I was referencing within Walgreens that was dedicated to uh, working with pharma companies um, at that time. What is your understanding as to the last year that Theranos received revenues from pharmaceutical companies? So again, I, I want to be careful about payment and revenue because I know we um, received payments at certain periods of time and then there was discussion and revision about when to recognize them. Um, I, I think the last years that we were paid um, was, was certainly prior to 14. Um, and <coughs> I, I don't know what year it was. Would 2011 sound right to you? I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's wrong. You wouldn't be surprised if it's wrong? Yeah, I, I don't know. OK, so you don't know at all when you might have received payments from the pharmaceutical companies? When the last payments were? Um, I, I don't. I Again, if you said 2011, I, I wouldn't doubt it. Who was responsible for those pharmaceutical company relationships in this time frame, if um, there was anyone? So I, I don't know what this specifically is referring to here. If it was an assumption around the pharmaceutical relationships that Walgreens had been working to foster, then it would have been Walgreens' relationships with pharma companies. Um, otherwise, um, we had originally had a sales force that had a relationship with the pharma companies. We then got rid of that sales force and built a new one that was retail focused. And had we reinstated those relationships, we I, I don't know who we would have used. Sonny would have made that decision because it reported to him. So you think that Sonny Balwani would have known about the pharma, the state status of the pharmaceutical relationships that Theranos had at this time? I, I believe so. <clears throat> so it sounds like Sonny Balwani would have known about the physician's office contracts that Theranos might have had, hospital uh, system contracts, and the pharmaceutical service contracts. and. Sonny was also involved in the Walgreens relationship and responsible for that as well, and that after a certain period of time, he was also responsible for the Safeway relationship. So what were you responsible for? I was, I was CEO of the company. I, from a technology perspective, was focused on inventions. I am named on a large number of our patents. I tried to contribute creatively to technical issues when we were dealing with technical <coughs> issues that would require invention. Um, I was very focused on the restructure to become a private company. I was focused on our vision and our strategy, and I ultimately became very focused on policy-related initiatives like the law change in Arizona and the work to try to build Medicare at lower prices and the work to try to advocate for regulation of LDTs. What was the last patent that you appeared on for Theranos? I, I don't know. I'm still writing memoranda of invention right now. So if you turn back to the macro market assumptions, which is the first page of the attachment, <clears throat> you'll see there's a list of looks like device costs. So for 2014, the device cost is 40000 For 2015, the device cost is 35000 Do you see that? I do. What do these costs depict? What device are these costs for? I, I don't know. Again, I didn't prepare this document. I'm, I'm not sure what these are referring to. <coughs> Was this consistent with the cost for a TSPU or a mini lab? How much did it cost to manufacture a, a mini lab in 2014? I, I, I don't know. I can tell you what it is right now. I, I don't know what it was then. How, how much did it cost to purchase a 
a Siemens Advia 1800 in 2014? I don't know. I, I would assume it was more than $40,000, but I don't know. Why do you make that assumption? I just have general understanding that the Siemens equipment was expensive. How did you gain that understanding? Um, because we're trying to liquidate a lot of it right now, and I have generally been in touch with our operations teams on how much money we can get from it. Did you know how expensive Siemens equipment was back in 2014? I, I probably didn't know the exact amount, no. Did you know that they were more expensive <coughs> than the cost to manufacture a TSPU in 2014? Yes. And how did you know that back in 2014? Because I was generally aware of the cost of traditional lab equipment. Can you think of any reason why the why the cost for a, a TSPU would be relevant to Theranos' projections for uh, at the end of 2014? I, I was I was just trying to look at that in here. I don't know if that was an assumption that we were building a certain number of devices for R and D. I don't know if that's in the R and D number. Uh, I I don't know. It, it, I mean, at, at the time, it wasn't it wasn't there, and it was his plan to. Uh, it, it, in, in your mind, in in October of 2014, Theranos was still very much in phase one of its Walgreens rollout. Is that fair? We were. Uh, you, you and you didn't have a specific date in mind at the time of when phase two would start. Is that fair? I I, I don't know. Um, at that time, I I know that we were just focused on engaging with FDA as much as we could to try to get the technologies through the FDA process. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know if we thought there was a specific date or not. I, I, I guess in, you know, in October 2014, did you expect to move to phase two by the end of, end of the year, by the end of 2014? I, again, I, I don't know exactly what my mindset was in 2014. I, I mean, sitting here now, don't think so, um, but um, I, I don't know. So if you were still in the phase one <clears throat> part of the model with Walgreens, where you were continuing to use, for a majority of the tests, the modified um, version of, of commercially available machines, and there was some Venus draw testing being done on referenced machines during that time as well, why wouldn't the device cost for a Siemens machine appear here under your assumptions? Again, I, I didn't create this document. I don't know what was selected for the assumptions. I know Sunny was working interactively with Team on trying to build models. I'm looking at it as we're talking and noting that this also includes things about number of Theranos units per hospital location in 2015. So it may have been associated with that assumption of phase two. I, I don't know. I, I guess in, in October of 2014, was, was Theranos planning on on sending any TSPUs to any hospitals imminently? We were planning on trying to get FDA clearance to do that. Um, again, I'm looking at this sitting here now and noting it says hospital location 2015, so I'm assuming sitting here now that the assumption in this document was that that would happen if we got FDA clearance in time to do so in 2015. But you'll see that the assumptions also use um, a device cost <clears throat> in 2014 of 40000 So I think Mr. Kolakar's question is, were you aware that Theranos was imminently and in the last two months of 2014 going to be sending TSPUs to hospitals? <coughs> no, we had to get FDA clearance prior to doing that. You always understood that Theranos needed FDA clearance of its TSPU before it could distribute them broadly, right? Yes. And did Sunny share that understanding with you? I, I think so. What's your basis for that understanding? Um, I'm trying to think of a specific conversation to answer that. I, it was it was my general understanding that that was our plan as a company, that the reason we were working so hard to get technology into the FDA was because it was required for phase two of our model. Okay. S sitting here today, do you, do you believe these assumptions about device costs and devices for hospitals could give a potential investor the impression that Theranos was using the TSPU for patient testing? 
exclusively at the time? I, I don't. Why not? Because we were so focused on the TSPU for phase two. Um, the only other thing I can think of here is that we might have been talking about building large numbers of them for use in our R&D and clinical studies. Uh, I, I don't know what else would have gone into it. I know, especially in this case, it'd be that there was very interactive engagement on the assumptions in the model, and I would have expected that there was very active discussion about these assumptions because I, th I think they were trying to build their own model. I mean, did you ever share with anyone that Theranos was using uh, either modified or, <coughs> or unmodified commercially available analyzers? I don't know. Um, I, I I don't know. So we turn to the next page, uh, the Theranos market assumptions page. Mm -hmm. You'll see that there are some assumptions here for uh, Walgreens and there's other RX locations. <clears throat> what did you understand the other RX locations to be referring to here? Some other retail pharmacy beside Walgreens. Okay, uh, so what other contracts did you have in place at this time other than Walgreens? Wouldn't that be Safeway? Yes, we had the Safeway relationship in place. Okay, so do you think that the other would have been referring to Safeway? It, it could have been. Again, I, I don't know. If you look at the Walgreens line, the assumptions here for December 14 is that Theranos services would have been rolled out to Walgreens store, uh, Walgreen stores in 300 locations. Do you see that? Yes. Is that consistent with your understanding of where things were headed with the Walgreens relationship? That by December 2014, there are no services would have been offered at 300 stores. I, I generally remember <laughs> that at that time we were really focused on rapidly ramping. I, I don't know if 300 was the number that we thought we would be at by the end of the year. So we talked um, in your earlier testimony about how, at some point, the parties were renegotiating the contract. Mm -hmm. And so, and those talks started happening, and that the last store actually opened in the fall of 2014. Do you remember that testimony? I do. OK. So do you think that it was achievable to open 300 stores you know, a month later after opening the last 41st store? Uh, again, I, I don't know what was behind these numbers in this model. I, I know that through the end of 14, I continued to believe that there was an opportunity to ramp rapidly with Walgreens. Uh, I, I don't know what the specific numbers that we were thinking at that time was. And then you remember our earlier, your earlier testimony in which uh, we established that by December 2014, the parties were talking about converting the business model to a rental agreement model. Do you remember that? I do. Okay, and so that would have required some modification of the contract if it came to pass, correct? Correct. Okay. So if you turn the page to the next page, you'll see that by December 2015, <clears throat> the assumption was that there are no services would be rolled out to 900 stores. Do you think that was reasonable in light of the fact that the parties were just beginning to talk about the rental agreement model in December of 2014? I do. Why? Because Walgreens used to refer to itself as an execution machine. They rolled out injections for vaccines in 8,100 stores in 12 months. We thought that um, you could roll out nationally within 12 to 18 months of the time you made a decision to do that. So. Turning back to these, the store assumptions for the end of 2014, did, did Mr. Balwani ever tell you that he expected Theranos to open 200 Walgreens locations by November 2014 or 300 by the end of the year? I, I don't remember specific conversations about those numbers. I remember feeling generally optimistic um, going into the fall of 14 that we were going to be ramping quickly. Uh, when did that optimism fade in your mind? I, I don't know that it ever faded. I mean, looking at the, the notes from the December meeting with Walgreens, the fact that they were endorsing the kind of model that we wanted to pursue, we, we continued to see as a really positive sign. 
So you'll see, um, turning back to the first mark, uh, market assumptions page, so we just talked about how other was likely Safeway since Theranos had no other contracts with other retail pharmacies, correct? I, again, I, I don't know what Sonny was thinking when he built this model. I, I, I can sit here and guess, but I, I don't know. But Theranos didn't have any other contracts with other retail pharmacies at this time besides Walgreens and Safeway, correct? Not that were signed. Okay. So, do you, th uh, based on what we saw before and the fact that things had slowed down with Safeway and the parties seemed to be disagreeing on a number of issues, do you think it was reasonable to think that 135 stores would be rolling out in Safeway with Theranos services in January 2015? I, I don't know that this was Safeway. Who else could it be? Well, I, I, I don't know what the date of this was. The Walton family had just, I, I think by this time invested, we were in talks with executives at Walmart about the potential to roll out there. We still had really good relationships with others from the grocery network at Safeway who wanted to work with us if it didn't have to be from Safeway. I, I just, I, I genuinely don't know what this was referring to. But you didn't have any contracts when it, with any other retail pharmacy besides Walgreens and Safeway. What would make you believe that in October 2014 you'd be able to open 135 stores, wellness centers, in January 2015? That's three months away. Well, she just answered your question. I, I, I don't know what this assumption was based on. I do know that by this point in time, we'd spent years working with, in terms of meetings, there wasn't a physical contract in place, multiple retailers on what this could look like, and I don't know what Sonny was thinking when he put this together or what its purpose was. Okay, just so we're not asking you to speculate here. So if you don't know, then you can just state that you don't know. So you have no idea as to how these assumptions came She's to answered your I question. I do not know. Okay. So you, you mentioned the, the, the conversations with Walmart. Did, uh, what was your view of the initial conversations with the, with the Walmart folks? My understanding was that first the people affiliated with the Walton family wanted to understand whether Walmart thought that this could be valuable and a potentially viable business model and then wanted to understand um, whether there was any conflict with them investing if Walmart at some point was to proceed with this and I, I believe both of those things turned out positively that Walmart thought that there was potential here and that it was also okay for the Walton family to invest. In other words, there, there, there was potential, but I, I guess specifics of a framework for agreement weren't being discussed in October 2014, were they? I, I don't know. Well, Walmart had a team of executives that came to Theranos and we had specific conversations about what a pilot could look like and how many stores and these types of things. <coughs> I, I, sitting here now, think that that probably would have required follow-up with other retailers, but I know that we generally believed that based on having had years of interactions with multiple retailers, there were opportunities to engage with other retailers quickly if we needed or wanted to do that. And, and with CVS, had, in, in October 2014, had, uh, had, had you shared with the Walgreens the potential for a contract with CVS on any retail pharmacy locations? I think we talked a lot with people at Walgreens about whether or not we would engage with CVS and trying to be respectful of the fact that Walgreens wanted us not to, but also trying to say to them, unless we get the kind of rollout that you described to us, uh, we're going to need to have another partner. Do you recall personally having any of those conversations? I, I don't know whether I did or not. I'm, I'm not sure. So if you look <clears throat> down uh, on that first page again of the market assumptions page, do you see that? Sorry, the first, first page, page yes. yeah. You'll see there is a line here called Rx tests per day per location. Is that uh, <coughs> requisitions per day per location? I, I think so. And is that a good proxy for patients per day per location? Um, I, I, I don't know. Um, it, I'm just trying to look at what's underneath it. I, I, I think it could be. Okay, so here in the assumptions, 
uh, it looks like Mr. Balwani is using 40 for October 2014. And in fact, um, I think that stays pretty constant through December 2015, if you look on the next page. Mm -hmm. So do you remember your earlier testimony uh, that you had seen a document showing that Walgreens was actually seeing about three patients per store per day in 2014? Tests of patients are different. Uh, totally different. I don't, do you understand my question? I, I, I don't, I'm sorry, could you clarify? My question was, do you remember your earlier testimony in which um, we discussed that by May 2014, you were aware that Walgreens was seeing three patients per store per day? I, I remember the document that you showed me. I don't know if I was aware of that at that time. Okay, and then also you said that you were aware that Walgreens was trying, or the goal for Walgreens was to reach 10 patients per store per day. Do you remember that? Yes. Okay, do you think it was reasonable for um, these financials to be assuming that Walgreens would have would, would have seen or would be seeing 40 patients per day in, in the stores by October 2014? Again, I'm not sure if this is patients per day because it says tests per day and I'm not exactly sure what that means. Um, I, I do know that our numbers ultimately crossed um, in the stores that were in the right locations, I believe above 60 uh, patients per day and higher. So if this is patients per day, then yes. Uh, Rx, what does that mean to you? It means prescription or pharmacy. I, I, I don't know. Okay, and so, I mean, 40 tests per day, that would seem pretty low, don't you think? I, I, I'm just saying I don't know why it says tests as opposed to patients. If it said patients, I would assume it would say, if he meant patients, I would assume he would write patients. I, I don't know. But, but don't you is. think that 40 tests per day per location, that would seem a little bit low to you, right? in terms of what? Uh, it would seem a little bit low to be using an assumption of 40 tests per day per location. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what what assumptions were going into this and what it was based on. I, As I said, I know that we ultimately saw more than 60 patients per day in a number of locations that were the models for how we thought we were going to be rolling out. And at the time, did you have a sense of how many tests each of those patients ordered on average? I, I don't know what my understanding was at the time. I, I generally understand now that there was about 3.2 CPT codes per order on average. Um, did you have any understanding at the time about about how the uh, patients per day translated in terms of numbers of tests there and us had to actually run? At, at that time? Right. I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm, I. I generally understood that as Sonny built models, he tried to study what other laboratories were doing and seeing in terms of number of patients per day and other metrics. So I, I believed that he was judging assumptions in general based on that research. So if you turn back to the first page of the macro market assumptions, yep. we'll see under retail pharmacy, the revenue per requisition is $40. We were just talking about how Theranos was looking to offer tests for four dollars. Does that seem a little high to you? I, I think it depends on how many tests are assumed in that requisition. Okay, so then do you think based on these uh, numbers that actually, because as, as you can tell, 40 is being multiplied by the 41 the 40, um, uh, 41 locations, Walgreens locations, and also another 40 tests per day per location. So do you think that maybe RX test actually does mean a requisition? I'm sorry, I, I didn't follow you. You said 40 is being multiplied by what? So if you see what Mr. Valwani is doing here, He's multiplying the number of locations for Walgreens of 41 in October of 2014 yep. by the number of tests per day per location mm -hmm. by, by the amount of money that you're receiving per requisition in order to get to the revenue figures. It 
where where is that? Here's the number of stores. Columns. Yeah. She's saying that you got forty one times forty equals sixteen hundred. That's what that's what you're pointing to. Right. Mm -hmm. But then I think you and also you said yeah. and if you multiply that again by <coughs> the amount of money that you're receiving per requisition, you would get the revenue figure of one point nine six eight. Okay. So do you think it makes sense then that RX test is actually a requisition? It, it could be. Okay. So you don't know one way or the other how these assumptions came about? I, I, I don't. Again, I was not involved in setting these. Do you have any concerns about these having been provided to potential investors? You know, if, if you weren't involved in preparing them, these went out under the Theranos name and were provided to potential investors. Yeah. Does that give you any cause? I, I don't know that they were provided to potential <coughs> investors. I see they were going back and forth with your. I don't know what the context of sending these to was, whether this was in the context of interactive engagement on building a model or not. I, I don't recognize this as the format of the final model. I, if something similar had been provided to other investors at the time, would that, or, or around the time, would, would that give you any concern? It depends on what the assumptions were based on. Right? If the same assumptions were used, would that concern you? The same assumptions as this? Yes. Meaning 40 patients per day and $40 requisition? Yes. And the 300 Walgreens stores by the end of 2014 and 900 by 2015. Would any of that give you pause? I, I, don't, I don't think that 900 by 2015 would have given me pause. Um, 40 patients per day sitting here now, given that I know that we beat that number uh, in the right stores, that would not have given me pause. The requisition of $40, I don't know <coughs> how many tests that was assuming, but I know that our uh, per uh, requisition income was higher than $40. Well, so you say that you knew that some stores were receiving 60 patients per day. Were you also aware that some Late, stores... Later. I don't know if it was at this time. Oh, okay. Um, Do you have a sense of when you came to kind of a more granular patients per store understanding? I think it was in 2015. Mm -hmm. I, I, can you say just geographically when? Like early 2015, late 2015? Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I mean, by late 2015, we were completely focused on engagement with CMS and FDA and the Wall Street Journal. So I would think at, at least middle of 2015, I don't know how early in to you, what was previously marked as Theranos Exhibit 213. Yep. Exhibit 213, uh, we have talked about earlier in your testimony, but you'll see that the first page... So, so I'm sorry, I, I got... Is this the document you just handed up? 
No. Two. No. Uh oh, you're going back to yeah. one that was yeah. earlier marked today. Yes. Yeah. Or not today, yeah. but on yeah. Tuesday. Yeah. So you'll see the first page is called Theranos Confidential Summary Capitalization. Yes. And then there's there's some financial information in the back. So I represented to you at the time that we marked this exhibit that this was produced by Theranos to the SEC <coughs> pursuant to subpoena as part of a binder that was provided by Theranos to Rupert Murdoch when he was considering whether to invest in Theranos in December 2014 and January 2015. So you'll, if you turn to the projected statement of income, which is 605, You'll see here that your these this um, document is projecting almost a billion dollars of revenue in 2015 and almost two billion dollars in revenue in 2016. Do you see that? I do. Okay. Uh, and if you turn back to the market assumptions page, oh, I'm sorry. I will be giving that to you just shortly. Um, but just so that you have this in front of you, you'll see that half of the revenues from 2015 and 2016 are from the retail pharmacy business. Do you see that? I do. Okay. Um, do you know what assumptions were used to get to those numbers, $425 million in 2015 and $993 million in 2016? I, I, I don't, sitting here now. Okay. Just looking further down the page, you see there's a number that's uh, listed next to EBITDA. EBITDA. Yes. Did, did you have an understanding in late 2014 of what that, what that number meant? Um, uh, I don't know. I, I don't think I focused on that. I, I don't know. Do you, do you understand today what it means? I understand that it's our earnings, um, and I, I think the percent margin means our profit margin. Did you have an expectation in, in late 2014 that that Theranos would be uh, would have 300 million dollars, over 300 million dollars in earnings um, at the end of 2015? Um, I, I think that I believed in whatever assumptions went into getting this kind of footprint and understood from the model that if we did that, we would be profitable. You see an item below that about depreciation? Mm-hmm. Uh, sorry, is that a yes? I do, I see it, yes. Sorry, the, um, uh, do, do you have an understanding of what's being depreciated there? No. Okay. So I'm going to hand to you what's been marked as Theranos Exhibit 228, and you can keep um, 213. Exhibit 213 in front of you. Exhibit 228 reports to be an Excel spreadsheet. On the first page, there is a screenshot of the metadata that's associated with uh, this file, and on the second page is where the actual document starts. Uh, the title is on the top of the first page is Theranos Confidential Market Assumptions with starting dates number THER-2550987. Mm -hmm. Have you seen Exhibit 228 before? besides the first page, which includes the metadata? I, I don't know. Okay. I'll, I'll represent to you that uh, this is the Excel spreadsheet that was produced by Theranos to the SEC pursuant to subpoena and represented by counsel to the SEC to be the financial model that produced the financial statements that are in the Rupert Murdoch binder. So that would be Exhibit 213. Mm -hmm. 
So if you look at the projected statement of income, which is on the, sec the third to last page of the document, this. you can go ahead and compare that to what you're seeing on that same page in ex Exhibit 213. Mm -hmm. Do they look identical to you? They, they do without the highlighting or whatever this is. Do the numbers look identical to you? They do. Okay. Why don't you turn back to the market assumptions page, which yeah, is the which, which is the, uh, of Exhibit 228. I'm sorry, why don't you turn to this? Oh, you're already on that page. So on this page, uh, this would be the second market assumptions page. You'll see here, uh, instead of projecting 900 stores for Walgreens in December 2015, now the projection is 1,340 stores in December 2015. Do you see that? I do. Do you know why this projection changed from 900 to 1,340 in the space of two months? I don't. I think Mr. Balwani would be the best person to answer that question. Yes. Okay. And then also, you'll see that instead of opening 190, uh, 135 store, uh, other stores in January 2015. Now the assumptions are that 135 stores will be open in April 2015. Do you see that? I do. Why do you think this change was made? I, I don't know. And then if you look further down, under retail pharmacies, there's uh, some assumptions related to the physician's offices and retail clinics. Do you see that? Yes. So in March 2015, the assumption for the number of physician's offices is 500. Do you see that? I do. What was the basis for believing that there are no would be in contract with 500 physicians' offices by March 2015. I, I don't know specifically. Sitting here now looking at it, I'm assuming there was some type of um, uh, tie to being at 100 uh, retail locations by that time. What, what was the relationship between the, the retail locations and the, and the, and the doctors? My general understanding has been that once we had a certain retail footprint around that retail footprint, we would then be able to contract with physician offices both to send people to the stores as well as to pick up samples. And, and that was your understanding in late 2014? I, I think so, yes. Okay, so if you look at hospitals, there are some assumptions there as well. And for January 2015, the assumption is that there would be 10 sites that would be using Theranos services. Do you know what that relates to? I do not. Okay, so if you turn back to Exhibit 213 then. And turn to page with Bates ending 607. You yes. see there are a number of additional comments at the bottom of the page, like footnotes. Do you see them? I do. Okay, and the first one says, please note all revenue projections are based on contracts already signed and in place for 2015 and 2016. No additional contracts are assumed signed. Do you see that? I do. And then if you go down to uh, number three here, it says Theranos has an exclusive contract with second largest grocery chain in the U.S. to be the only lab in those locations. Was that referring to Safeway? I don't know. So would you agree, though, that 
investors who would be receiving these financial statements, including Rupert Murdoch, would believe that these numbers were based on already signed contracts, based on these additional comments? I, I, I don't think, I, I, I can't speak for them. Um, our understanding was that we engaged um, very directly with any questions that investors had about um, what was important to them in evaluating the investment. But you, if you had received these, would you understand then, based on these comments on this page, that the revenue projections were based on contracts already signed by Theranos? I, I, I don't know. I, I, reflecting in my head on the kind of conversations that happened with investors around uh, their investment in the company, and we were very open about the state of our relationships with retail pharmacy partners. Okay, what about other businesses like hospitals and physicians' offices? Were you very <coughs> forthright with investors about those contracts as well? My understanding is that we generally discussed the fact that Intermountain and Dignity had invested through Peer and that we thought that there was opportunity to engage with them in providing services because they had an investment and that therefore we would be able to rapidly do that as soon as we were ready. Besides Intermountain and Dignity, what other hospitals did Theranos have contracts with? I, I don't know. As, as I said earlier, I know that there was work in Arizona to engage with what I was calling hospitals or health systems. Um, I don't know by memory which ones uh, the company ultimately signed contracts with. Do you recall discussing Exhibit 213 with Mr. Murdoch and his associates? I, I don't recall discussing this uh, specifically. Um, I know um, after we he invested, we had discussions about um, what we thought we could do financially in terms of projections. What, what do you mean by that? When do you think he invested? Um, it's my memory that he communicated that he wanted to invest um, as early as, I want to say October, but that's probably wrong specifically, and we, we later sent him all these materials. Um, we then, I, I had a couple meetings with him after he invested, I think, in early 2015, and generally discussed you know, what we thought the potential was um, for um, number of stores and associated <coughs> revenue. That, that's the only time I can remember specifically discussing numbers with him. See, so just so I understand, is it your general understanding that you only discussed sort of the financial potential of the company after he had actually invested in Theranos? That's the only time that I personally can remember talking about it with him. He, he came to Theranos um, before he invested, and Sonny was in the meeting, and I can't remember if financials were discussed in that meeting or not. Um, but I, I remember after he invested, sort of having a conversation about how do you think you're doing and talking about you know, the challenges in rolling out in retail and what we thought we were going to be able to do or make up. Uh, you mentioned a sort of a meeting with him and his son before he invested. Do, do you remember any other in-person meetings <coughs> with Mr. Murdoch um, at Theranos before he invested? Um, I don't remember any other meetings at Theranos. Uh, what other meetings do you recall? Um, the first time I met him and then when he decided to invest, um, which was um, a meeting at his ranch uh, near San Francisco. Do, do you recall Sonny ever telling uh, Mr. Murdoch anything about the financial uh, possibilities of the company? Uh, again, I know he was in a meeting with um, Rupert and I, I can't remember exactly whether Sonny presented on the financials there or not, or just discussed them, I'm, I'm not sure. W were you present for that meeting, I guess, or are you? I, I was, okay. I was. Yeah. So, so if Sonny had presented is that something, you would, you would have been in attendance at least? I, I was, okay. yes. What was the company's cash balance as of the end of 2013? Um, I believe, um, we received the $75 million payment from Walgreens right at the end of 2013, so I, I think it was at least $75 million. 
Okay. Were you aware that the company was running out of money at that time? Yes. Okay. And, and was that uh, part of the reason why Theranos wanted to accelerate the innovation fee payments from Walgreens? I think the initial reason for trying to accelerate the innovation fee payments from Walgreens was that we were investing a lot of money into the Walgreens relationship and it was not going to be sustainable uh, if they didn't make this payment. Um, so that, that was the primary driver for it. Okay. Was, that, was it also part of the reason why you ended up going out to raise more capital from investors? I'm, I'm sorry, was what? Was the fact that the company was running out of money at the end of 2013 also the reason why you went out to raise more capital from investors? The, the raises happened after that. Um, so by that time, we'd received the payment from Walgreens, and we didn't need capital to continue operations. What was your burn rate on cash per month in that time frame? I don't know. Do you think it was something like $10 million? In early 14? In early 14. I, I, I don't know. So even if you had, say, $75 million from Walgreens, that would likely only last, you know, say, a year maybe at most? Is that consistent with what you would understand? No. The, the payment of the 75 from Walgreens to us meant we were going to be expanding nationally. So at that point, we thought financially the company was in a strong position. So, so why did why did Theranos engage with with the partner fund around the late 2013, early 2014 period uh, in connection with an investment? Uh, partner fund was introduced to us as someone who was interested in investing, um, and um, our first meeting with them was in I, I think December of 2013. Yeah, but is your testimony today that sort of their potential investment was not viewed as potential source of operating capital in your mind? I, I believe, and I'm, I'm speculating a bit here, but knowing now that the first meeting was around December 10th, um, we certainly wouldn't have expected that we would be closing investment from them before the end of December. I think we, we thought that our, our business lived on getting payment from Walgreens, and then it was really a question of was PFM going to be the kind of long-term investor that we wanted to begin to bring in? Uh, because at that point, not only did we have the payment from Walgreens, we also had some capital from existing shareholders that had been invested. So I'm going to hand back to you, uh, and you can put those two exhibits away, but I'm going to hand back to you what was previously marked. Uh, there's actually just one thing I want to look okay. at in here. Okay. All right. So this is Exhibit 221 that I'm handing over to you. Yes. These this is the same the, one? Yes. Yeah. Okay. These are the text messages between uh, you and Mr. Balwani. Yes. So if you can turn to the page with Bates sending 6263. 6263. Yes. So you'll see towards the bottom of the page, uh, there is a text message from Sunny Balwani uh, on November 21st, 2013 at 535. And he says, you should make yourself comfortable with financial models. Al alternatively, you can cover everything else and I can meet with him on Tuesday and answer any questions. Do you see that? Yes. And then a couple text messages down, you say, I'll get myself comfortable. Let me know what file to use. And then if you go on to the next page, which is 6264, there's a number of redactions, um, but about six messages down, uh, there's another text message from Mr. Balwani to you, and he says, please close the file, file under DST folder under FIN, not safe to give him yet. 
and then another message where he says under DST, uh, and then a few more messages down, you respond to him, can I edit it? There are typos. Okay to open. Do you see that? I do. What do you recall about what was going on here? Uh, I'm not sure. Does it look like you were opening a file on uh, Mr. Bal in Mr. Balwani's folder in order to edit some files? It, it looks like I was opening a file under his folder, yes. I, I don't know if I edited it. What is DST? I think this refers to... Did you understand them to be a potential investor in Theranos at this time? I think so. Yeah. So do you think that you opened the file and reviewed it at the time? I, I don't know. Does it look like you did? Mr. Balwani says, please close the file. I'm sorry, where does he say that? On 6264 at 5.38 p.m. I, I don't know. Were there other instances in which you might have opened a file and reviewed it? Yes and other instances in which you might have opened a financial model that Sonny Balwani was working on and reviewed it? Could have been. Uh, do you recall any instance in which you edited a financial model that he was working on? No. Okay, we can take a short break. We're off record at 3.03 p.m. We are back on the record at 325. Ms. Holmes, did you have any substantive conversations with the SEC staff during the break? No. So I, I want to switch gears again, and, and now we're going to talk about Theranos' communications with FDA. Do you recall communications that Theranos had with FDA that started in 2012? Yes. Why did you start having those conversations with the agency? Uh, do you mean generally or the ones in 2012 specifically? Uh, the ones in 2012 specifically. Um, I believe FDA had questions about um, information that they had heard about Theranos and we wanted to answer their questions and give them any information on our work that they wanted. What questions did they have? I, I think that they thought that we were trying to sell our devices to other laboratories at the time, and we tried to immediately convey to them that we weren't, and that we had actually hoped to come in and start working with them when our lab-developed tests came live, and that we were hopeful that we could take them through the regulatory process. And so why did the FDA have these questions? Did somebody bring a concern to their attention? I, I think there was a miscommunication with um, people that we had been interacting with uh, in DOD. In the Department of Defense? Yes. Uh, what information would the DOD have given FDA uh, with respect to or concerning Theranos' possible sale of devices? I, I don't know what information they gave the FDA. What were your talks with the DOD about that led to DOD contacting FDA? I, I actually don't know why DOD contacted the FDA. I, I, I'm not sure. I'm going to hand to you what's been marked. Theranos was at 229. Oh, sorry. Exhibit 229 purports to be a letter with Hyman Phelps and McNamara letterhead dated November 26, 2013. The letter is addressed to the FDA and the starting date's <coughs> number is TS-0995690. Have you seen Exhibit 229 before? You know, I, I don't remember this letter specifically, but I, I recognize the letterhead as 
do you remember having discussions with Hyman Phelps about sending a letter to FDA in this time frame? <coughs> um, I, I have to read the letter to remember exactly what this was referring to, but I know that this was one of our regulatory council that was advising us as we were engaging with the FDA in 2013. How generally would you communicate with the FDA? Would you include regulatory counsel, or would you ha have discussions with FDA uh, directly? I, I think both. Okay, and on what occasions would you be having direct conversations with FDA versus having your law firm communicate with them? The, the first one that comes to mind is we would have interactive review with their um, teams and in that context we were directly engaged we, we may have had in-house regulatory counsel involved in that but but generally not outside regulatory counsel would you expect that a law firm that you hired would discuss with you the possibility of sending a letter to FDA before doing so yes okay and do you, would you expect that that law firm would also discuss what they were planning to say to the FDA before going ahead and communicating with FDA? On, on behalf of Theranos? Yes. Yes. Okay. So do you have any reason to doubt that you knew at the time that Hyman Phelps was sending this letter to the FDA? No. So if you turn to uh, the attachment to the letter, which starts on 700, yes. you'll see that the attachment is some meeting minutes for a meeting on October 15th, 2012, and the minutes themselves are dated November 16th, 2012. Do you see that? Yes. Were you present at this meeting in October 15th, 2012? Yes. So it was a meeting between uh, Theranos then and CDRH, correct? Yes. And I, in this I didn't know they were CDRH. I thought of them as FDA, but I see that here. Okay. Um, that's fine. Uh, so you understood that you were at a meeting on this day with the FDA? Yes. Okay. Um, and your counsel wasn't involved in this meeting, right? They were not present at the meeting. Why not? because we wanted to directly engage we, with the FDA. Just, just a sec, I mean, to the extent that, that I mean, you can answer that, but I mean, to the extent that you're asking for communications that you had with counsel about what your strategy was and why they showed up, then you shouldn't answer that. Right, so, and I'm not asking, I mean, yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm not asking about your conversations with counsel, but I'm wondering if you can answer the question why you didn't include regulatory counsel in that meeting. I, I think in general we wanted to directly engage with, with people at the agency. Okay. So, do you recall this meeting? Yes. Okay. What was discussed? Um, my memory is, um, first, their explicit concerns based on information that they had heard, and then secondly, um, we attempted to communicate that we really wanted to engage successfully with the FDA and try to create a model for becoming the first company to take all their LDTs through the FDA process. Okay, so if you look at the first page of these minutes on 700, oh, and, and actually before, before we look at that, do you know who drafted these minutes? Someone at the FDA. So if you look uh, in that first paragraph, uh, following uh, the following information is meant to summarize the issues raised at the meeting, the first uh, bigger paragraph starting with FDA, about halfway through the paragraph it says, it was stated very early in the meeting that the FDA does not consider the assays to be ASRs and distribution of the Theranos system, analyzer, and reagents in the U.S. as an LDT is not appropriate. Do you remember them telling you that? I don't remember this communication of this sentence specifically. Do you remember them telling you that they did not believe that Theranos' system and its reagents would be considered LDTs? 
I, I remember them saying that if we were commercially distributing the device, uh, that that would not be an LDT, but that if we were running the tests in our lab, that would be an LDT. Okay, it goes on to say, Theranos was also informed that many of the potential assays that could be used on their analyzer are nucleic acid-based or are classified as class 2 or class 3. Therefore, classification of the instrument as a class 1 device is incorrect and requires pre-market clearance or approval for marketing in the United States. Do you see that? I do. Did they tell you that your assays uh, would be classified as class 2 and class 3 and wouldn't be considered a class 1 device? I, if I am reading this correctly sitting here now, I think it's referring to the fact that the device would be classified according to whatever test you were pursuing clearance with. Okay, but did you understand here then that they were telling you that because the assays were not considered uh, class one devices that the system as well wouldn't be considered a class one device? Um, I, 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 I don't remember thinking about this at the time. Sitting here now, I interpret it as if you file for clearance on one of these assays, the whole test system is going to be classified according to the classification of the assay. Okay, but in any case, it looks like uh, because of the types of assays that Theranos was thinking of performing on its device, uh, it was likely that they were not going to be considered class one devices. Isn't that what they told you? I, again, I, I don't remember the specific part of the discussion with them. I mean, at, at the time, you understood what a nucleic acid-based assay was, right? Yes. And uh, I mean, for a layman, is it is it fair to say that those are more complicated than a um, than other types types of assays? Or, 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 or did you have an understanding that they that they were generally run on class two devices at the time? Uh, again, I'm not sure about this part of the discussion. I don't have specific memory of it. I I believe that this is essentially saying that nucleic acid tests in general are class two or class three, and therefore, if you file a piece of hardware with those chemistries, that piece of hardware will be treated in the same way as the chemistry is treated. Okay, and and. Um, I, I guess leaving that, leaving that meeting with the FDA, did, did you have that understanding that the type of assay would um, dictate what sort of class treatment the, the approval that you were seeking from the FDA would require for the assays? Yes. And not necessarily the type of assay, but the specific assay itself, for example. Yep. I'm sorry, I was using type of assay because that's the only way I could think about it, but I, I think I understand your yeah. answer. Okay, and then in the second paragraph, towards the bottom of the page, you'll see there's a sentence that starts, however. Do you see that? Yes. And it says, however, it was pointed out that the deployment of Theranos systems for research or investigational use at U.S. military facilities in Afghanistan for evaluation purposes is acceptable and does not violate any regulations as long as the results obtained during the evaluation are strictly not used for patient diagnosed, diagnosis and management. And Theranos follows required labeling regulations stated in CFR 21809.10. So here, Theranos had told you that it was fine to use the Theranos system for um, research purposes, but not fine to use it for patient testing. Is, is that what you understand as to what they told you at this meeting? You said Theranos. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> so here, it seems that the FDA is telling you that um, it was fine to use a Theranos system for research purposes, but not for patient diagnosis. Is that what you understood that they told you that day? No, uh, it's not. What is your understanding? My understanding was that the majority of the meeting was based on a discussion about what an LDT is and that our tests were able to be used as LDTs so long as they were in the same facility that they were developed, but that to the extent they would be distributed, they would no longer be LDTs based on the commentary in this meeting. Okay, but you agree that that's not exactly what is being written in these minutes, right? Um, do, do you mind if I take a minute just to look at this document? Sure.
Yeah, it, it, if you look on the first page where it says, as Theranos has established a CLIA certified laboratory in Palo Alto, under enforcement discretion, use of a test developed and validated by the laboratory in which meets the definition of an LDT can be performed on clinical samples which are shipped back to the CLIA lab in Palo Alto, and results can then be transmitted to an ordering physician. So what was your understanding from that? That this um, model was um, consistent with FDA's enforcement discretion for laboratory developed tests. Okay, so how do you square that with what FDA then subsequently writes here, which is that it's fine to use the system for research purposes, but not for diagnosis pur purposes? It was my understanding that those are two different discussion topics. The specific discussion about investigational use was with respect to distributing the devices for use in a U.S. military facility outside of the U.S. So you're saying that FDA told you that it was fine to have the device here in the U.S., but it was not fine to ship it overseas for patient diagnosis? No. Well, what's the distinction? My understanding is that FDA was saying that distribution of the device in the U.S. makes it not an LDT, that distribution of the device in the U.S. or outside of the U.S. could be done in an investigational basis, and that the sentence that I just read was consistent with their enforcement discretion for LDTs. Okay. Uh, why don't we go on to the paragraph that starts to move forward. It's the second full paragraph down on 701. So it says, to move forward with the regulatory process, the agency recommended that for their first submission, Theranos should pick an analyte or a panel of analytes that may be of interest to DOD and proceed to work interactively with the agency to develop a regulatory pathway to achieve pre-market clearance approval status. So FDA here was telling you that you did need to achieve pre-market clearance or approval status for the system, correct? if we were going to distribute the device. If you were going to distribute the device where? Outside of Theranos' clinical laboratory facility. Okay. So you were aware that you would need to, at least by 2012, that you would need to obtain either approval or clearance status from the FDA before distributing the device to some place besides the laboratory. Is that right? That was what was discussed in this meeting. Is we engaged with regulatory council a lot on that to understand um, how to interpret the regulations around that. So I guess again, without asking about your specific conversations with council, sure. it, it, around this time in late 2012, um, was it your understanding that Theranos would have to get approval from the FDA before uh, distributing its device outside the CLIA lab? We understand. I, I believe I understood that that was what was said in this meeting. Okay. W w what, what did you understand the FDA required about uh, fr from, from Theranos in order to distribute its, its TSPU as of the end of 2012, whether at this meeting or otherwise? Um, I want to make sure I'm answering your question. What I understood in this meeting was that FD, the FDA representatives there were saying that to distribute our device, we should get the FDA clearance that was commensurate with whatever test we would try to get through the clearance process. Did you have any personal view that was different from what the FDA described for you at this meeting? So I, I don't know if that gets into privileged questions. We had very active engagement with regulatory counsel on this topic. Well, so, so I think you can you can tell them what you understood at various points in time. I don't get into the advice that you were given, but you can you can under, explain what you're understanding. Huge amount of it's already in the public record through letters from those councils. So, okay. So our I, my understanding was that um, there was certainly a belief that a clinical laboratory could use technology within its own patient service centers even without receiving clearance of the device. We engaged with the FDA a lot on that later, and we ultimately responded to their request that we pursue 510K clearance on the device and the tests, and, and did with our, with our first test. 
Is that what you're referring to with the HSV-1? Yes. So you just said that they requested that you submit 510K uh, submissions. When did that happen? Um, so we began um, engaging interactively with them right before we announced our retail rollout. And um, over a period of months uh, following that initial engagement. OK, so that would have been in 2013? Um, I, I don't know. I, I know that in 2013, we sent in a lot of pre-submissions. I think there was initially a focus on those, and then on the nanotainer, and then later to get a test on the device cleared. OK, so they requested. Um, 510K submissions for the test you said, the nanotainer, and what was the third? Uh, no, I'm sorry, I didn't say they requested them. Uh, you asked when they asked us to submit the device, and I, I said that I, I don't know when exactly they asked us to submit the device. I know that after we initially reached out to them to let them know that we would be launching at retail, um, the first focus with them was on the pre-submissions for the tests. They then requested that we um, agree to do a 510K submission on the nanotainer. And I know it was after that that they began to focus on the importance of getting clearance on the device, I, based on my memory. OK, so just to move back then, you're saying that you submitted pre-submissions to FDA. They asked for the device, and it was sometime after that that they re then requested a 510K submission for the nanotainer. No, I, th I think the sequencing was was first a, a general discussion about the commitment to work with the agency, even though we were pursuing the model that was described here as an LDT. That manifested in a lot of pre-submissions. The, as I remember it, initial specific request was to proceed with 510K on the nanotainers, and later there was specific communication that it was important to them to focus on clearance of the device. Okay, so if you look with then, a test. If you look then back at the first page of the letter from Hyman Phelps. Yes. Uh, it looks like there was also a meeting on November 4th, 2013. Do you see a reference to that in the letter? Yes. Did you attend that meeting as well? I, I don't know, but I think I did. Okay, what happened at that meeting? I'm, I'm not sure which meeting this was. There was a lot of engagement with FDA during this period. Okay, well then, why don't we just look back at Exhibit 229. So about halfway down the paragraph, uh, second to last sentence, Theranos has been working closely with OIR for the past four months to develop a plan for the submission and review of multiple 510K pre-market notifications to cover hundreds of assays. Those discussions have been extremely productive due to the open communication. So is this what you were referring to earlier as the 510K pre-submissions that, that Theranos had prepared? Yes. OK. And then it goes on to say, we were therefore very surprised to hear OIR for the first time question whether in the phase one model, Theranos' laboratory testing complies with the Federal, Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Because in OIR's view, the company is not offering laboratory-developed tests. And here, the phase one model, is that the phase one model that you had been describing to us with Walgreens? I, I think so. I, again, haven't, I, I don't know exactly what's described in here, but I think so. OK. I mean, we can, we can turn to the next page, which is um, uh, 691 under background. And the second paragraph there talks a little bit about the phase one model, which is that testing is conducted only at full Theranos laboratory on patient samples that are shipped to the facility. So mm -hmm. is that consistent with your understanding of what the phase one model was? Yes. OK. Um, so here, it sounds like FDA told Theranos at this November 4th, 2013 meeting that the company was not offering LDTs. Um, I, I don't know that they told us that we were not offering LDTs. I think that one of the people in one of the meetings said that they didn't know whether our LDTs uh, would um, warrant enforcement discretion by the FDA. Do you remember who that person was? I, I believe it was division. 
Did anyone at that meeting express any different views from what you recall? Um, at least from, from the FDA side. I, I don't know who was in that meeting. We had a lot of engagement with division that we worked with and also with, as we went along to try to make sure we were doing the right thing. So you just said that there were questions that were raised as to whether your tests um, would be classified as LDTs. Would get enforcement discretion as LDTs, as, as I remember it. Okay. Um, did FDA ever <coughs> tell you subsequently that it didn't consider your tests to be LDTs? I, I don't know. There was there was a large number of interactions with them and I generally understood that where this came out was that if we continued working with them in good faith that we would have enforcement discretion. Do you recall telling in prospective investors in 2014 that Theranos's assays were LDTs that fell under FDA's enforcement discretion? I, I don't have specific recollections of that but I know we would openly talk about um, the test being LDTs. So did you also disclose to them that there were talks back and forth and FDA wasn't sure whether Theranos' test would be considered LDTs? Um, I, I don't know. I, I don't remember specific conversations on this. I, I believe at that time we'd been operating for a year under enforcement discretion and so we, we really believed at that point that we were in good faith operating under enforcement discretion. I guess at that time in, in late 2014, did, is it fair to say you viewed Theranos' um, approach and plan to take all of its LDTs through through the FDA process as sort of a, a differentiating factor between you and your competition? We did. Why is that? Because no other company that we knew of was voluntarily saying to the FDA that they wanted to take all these tests through the FDA clearance process. And in fact, they were actively um, campaigning to prevent FDA from regulating LDTs. And, and Theranos had taken sort of the opposite approach, filing a comment to, to pursue a FDA oversight over LDTs. Is that, we is did. that correct? And to you what's been marked there in us was at 230. Exhibit 230 purports to be a letter from the Department of Health and Human Services, FDA, to there in us. The date is June 13th, 2014, with starting dates number TS-0992588. Have you seen Exhibit 230 before? I, I think so. I'm not sure. Do you have any reason to believe that you didn't receive this and didn't review it? No. So if you look on the second page of the letter, FDA is now writing to Theranos about um, the pre-market protocol that Theranos had submitted for review. If you look on the second page, there's a paragraph that starts with based on prior conversations. Do you see that? Yes. So FDA writes here, based on prior conversations between FDA and Theranos and documents sent from Theranos to FDA, FDA had understood that you were currently using mostly cleared or approved assays in your laboratory. However, the more complete information you recently sent per our request clarified that the tests you perform are FDA cleared assays running a Theranos protocol i.e. modified under the CLIA regulations, or are Theranos assays run on the TSPU. Therefore, most of the tests you're running in your lab appear to be lab laboratory developed tests, LDTs, currently under FDA's enforcement discretion, and the rest are tests run on your TSPU that require clearance or approval prior to their use and are not under enforcement discretion. 
So here, FDA is telling you that first it misunderstood what devices Theranos was using, correct? Uh, this specific person who wrote this memo is saying that. Yeah. And also that, um, and also that actually the rest, the, the tests that are run on the TSPU would not be considered LDTs. Correct? Um, yes, that's what I, I understand the sentence to mean. Okay. Did you understand that at the time as well? So I, I don't remember exactly when I read this, but I know that we engaged with FDA very frequently on the fact that we were running these tests in our clinical lab, what tests, we sent them spreadsheets with exactly what platform was being used and how many tests per month to make sure that we were still in good faith operating under enforcement discretion. By pl platform, do you mean device? Or yes. Uh, and did, did you know, is it someone you've interacted with? Um, I, I, I think that I started interacting with her to the extent I joined calls on the clearance of the nanotainer after this period of time, but I'm, I'm not completely sure. Who's? He is also now. So was he um, maintaining the relationship between Theranos and FDA during this time frame? He, he was one of the people, I think there were others who were also involved, but yes, he was a, a constant in it. Were there any interactions that you had with FDA that he was not a part of? Um, probably, I, I don't know any specifically, but th there was a lot of interactions with FDA. Okay, so at the bottom of the page, there is a sentence that starts, therefore, do you see that? Yes. It says, therefore, based on this new information, we recommend that clearance of your capillary tubes and nanotainers be obtained over time as you receive clearance or approval for each individual assay as part of that test system. Please note that without clearance or approval, you cannot continue to ship these collection devices or nanotainers to your sample collection sites for use with tests currently run in your laboratory. So did you understand from FDA at this time that they were telling you that Theranos could not continue shipping the nanotainers? To uh, from the patient service centers to the Theranos lab because they weren't cleared by FDA? I, I think our understanding at the time we got this memo was that they were saying in this memo that there was no way to get clearance, general clearance on the nanotainers if we needed to use LDTs to get that clearance and therefore we would need to do this and we immediately began to engage with them on that and on, in fact, proceeding with general clearance of the nanotainers. Okay, so did you stop using the nanotainers then while you were engaging with them on getting approval or clearance? No. Why not? Because we understood following this letter that it was okay to do that if instead of trying to use the LDTs for the clearance of the nanotainer, we actually used commercial machines and pooled the samples and that's what we ended up doing. What do you mean by that? If, if, explain that distinction, I guess, between using the LDT and using the commercial machine, just so I understand it. Yeah, so it's my understanding that what this letter was predicated on was a belief that if we needed to use LDTs or uncleared tests to be able to show that the nanotainers worked, then that would not be acceptable to the FDA as a means to get the nanotainers cleared because they wanted us to use a, a test system that had already been cleared for those experiments. So if we were comparing, for example, nanotainer to somebody else's tube and we were using an LDT, they didn't want the LDT for doing that comparison. They wanted us to use a system that was cleared. My understanding is that after this, when we agreed to use commercial machines for that purpose, uh, that there was a path to get the nanotainers cleared, and we began working toward that. And the way that we accommodated that is that to get enough sample to run the cleared commercial machine, you would take, for example, you know, five finger sticks from a single person, pool them together to get enough sample, 
and then you could run the commercial machine to do the comparison between our tube and someone else's tube. And, and, and when you say run the commercial machine, meaning an unmodified, un unmodified predicate device? Correct. So why was it your understanding, though, that because you had agreed with FDA to use cleared uh, assays in order to provide this data for clearance of the nanotainer, that it was appropriate to continue using the nanotainer while you were submitting this data? Because once there was, once we agreed that there was a path to get clearance of the nanotainer, we understood that we were in good faith operating under enforcement discretion still. And how did you gain that understanding? Based on our ongoing interactions with the FDA. Who told you that? Um, I believe there were multiple conversations in which we um, wanted to make sure that we were okay uh, continuing to use the, the nanotainer and, and interpreted the feedback on those conversations to mean that we were. But who told you it? I mean, I, I specifically remember a conversation around Christmas Eve with, um, in which he had indicated that there was a path with the submissions that we had sent in after this to move toward clearance, that they wanted more data for, I think, two of the three filings that we'd made, but that we could potentially in the short term get clearance on hematology, and I had asked, wanting to make sure we were continuing to be in good standing, and I interpreted what he said to mean that so long as we continued to work with them, it was okay to do that. So never told you that you could continue using the nanotainers. You're just interpreting the fact that he said there might be a path forward to clearance as him telling you that I, you I could continue th I using. That Wait, just let me finish. I'm, that I'm you sorry. could continue using the nanotainers. I, I thought that I had asked him on that call, "Is it okay to? You know, we want to make sure we're doing the right thing and continuing to operate while we're going through this process." And I, I remember interpreting what he said as being. Um, assuring of the fact that so long we continued to work with them in good standing that um, that we could continue to operate under enforcement discretion. Was anyone else on that call? Uh, no, but I remember sending notes to my team uh, immediately after it. I'm handing to you what's been marked there in S Exhibit 231. Exhibit 231 purports to be minutes of a meeting that took place between Theranos and FDA on June 19th, 2014. It's a teleconference meeting, it looks like, and the starting dates number is THER-0353763. Have you seen ex Exhibit 231 before? I, I don't remember it specifically, but I think so. Do you know who drafted these minutes? I don't. Did you attend this meeting on June 19, 2014 with the FDA? I think so. What was the purpose of the meeting? I don't know. What was the role in the discussions with FDA? I, it varied over time. He was our, our technical expert on uh, a lot of the technology that we worked on in, in certain areas, data analysis. Okay, so why was he being included in this meeting, though? I, I don't know specifically. I haven't read these minutes, but I would assume for the purpose of being a technical lead. Okay, and do you recall if Mr. Balwani attended? I, I, I don't. I don't remember this meeting specifically. So if you turn to page 4, or 3766 <coughs> in the document, towards the bottom of the page, about two-thirds down from the top of the page, it says, FDA inquired whether Theranos was sending out the tubes for use at this time. Are the tubes being used in commercial testing? 
Um, and then again, it says FDA inquired as to whether Theranos was shipping the capillary tubes and nanotainers to the collection sites. Theranos said yes. FDA said that Theranos should not be shipping collection devices for clinical use until Theranos obtains FDA clearance. Theranos should use other cleared collection devices and then transfer the sample to the other containers if necessary for testing at the Theranos lab. So FDA here is telling you unequivocally that Theranos should stop shipping these nanotainers, correct? I, I think that was what was said in this meeting. Do you recall what was said in this meeting? Do you recall that being said? I, I don't. I guess, do, do you have any recollection at any point in time of FDA telling you specifically to stop shipping the uh, nanotainers in, in this time frame? Uh, again, I, I remember that when the people on the team that we were working with thought that we would not be able to get general clearance for the nanotainers, there was then discussion that we would potentially not be able to use the nanotainer because we could no longer work interactively with the agency toward that. But once we worked through that and moved to the revised model that I was talking about earlier, it was my understanding that we were OK continuing to use the tubes under enforcement discretion. And, and when do you think you transitioned to that revised model? Um, I know that we'd gotten feedback on the submissions by December. I think I, we would have submitted them months I, I think before that, I don't know exactly when the decision was made that that, to do that. Uh, are, you saying, are you referring to December 2013 or December 2014? I, I think this was in 2014. And, and, and was, you mentioned a Christmas Eve conversation with yes. um, the, Was that 2013 or 2014? I, I think it was 2014. Did you ever tell prospective investors in fall of 2014 that it was not, that Theranos was not required to obtain clearance or approval for its testing system? I don't think we would have said that. I think we talked about our belief that the system was an LDT and that we wanted to take the system and the test through the FDA. And when you're referring to the system there, what, what, were you, what exactly were you referring to as the Theranos system? In answer to her question, I was referring to the tests that would be run um, on proprietary Theranos devices. Okay, so collecting device from a finger, stick, placing it in an entertainer, testing on a TSPU. Yes. And, and that, that's consistent with the clearance and clear waiver we got on the HSV-1 test system. Did you ever tell prospective investors that Theranos was seeking FDA approval voluntarily? Um, I'm trying to remember how we worded it. Um, I, I don't know specifically how we described it. I, I, I think we talked about the fact that we believed our systems were LDTs and that we, we wanted proactively to engage with the agency on it, on all our tests. Did you ever tell investors that Theranos was seeking FDA approval voluntarily because FDA approval was the gold standard or the highest standard in the in industry? I, I, think, I think we would have said something like that. Why would you tell investors that Theranos was seeking FDA approval voluntarily if that wasn't true? We thought it was. Why did you think it was? Because we thought that the testing that we were doing fell squarely within the definition of an LDT, and we knew that that was a controversial field where regulations were evolving, um, but we engaged with multiple of the top law firms in the country to, to research that. and. We really wanted to take the systems into the FDA and try to get clearance. But here, FDA is telling you that you have to get it approved before using the nanotainer devices and sending them from the patient service centers to the Theranos lab. How does that square with you thinking that approval was voluntary or that FDA wasn't requiring it? This is specific to the capillary tubes. I was talking earlier about the tests. In response to your question, my understanding is that, as I understood the issue with the capillary tubes, there was a period of time 
in which we were discussing with FDA whether it would be possible to get general clearance at all on the capillary tubes, and that then presented these issues about the inability to use the tubes. And I understood that if we were able to find a way to proceed with getting clearance, then we could continue to operate under enforcement discretion because we would be working in good faith with the agency. So you're making a distinction here between the tests and the nanotainer device. Yes. Did you ever tell investors that FDA thought you needed to obtain approval or clearance for the nanotainer? I, I don't remember specific conversations to that effect, but I, I think we discussed the fact that we were working to get the nanotainers cleared with investors. Who did you discuss that with? Again, I don't remember specific conversations about it. You don't remember? I don't. I just want to have a clear sense of your memory of the, your conversations about the FDA with prospective investors. Uh, it, it, it was The conversations about the FDA with prospective investors was always about the, the Theranos system as you just described it, which was, uh, you know, proprietary nanotainer, uh, proprietary TSPU. Is that, is that correct? Yes, about the, the tests on the TSPU, and specifically the tests, the device and cartridge, and the software, and then also additionally on the nanotainer by itself as a standalone product. Did, did, did you ever talk about uh, regulatory uh, requirements for Theranos' test that it was running on modified predicate devices? It, it was our understanding that those were operating as traditional LDTs. Um, and that would, would clearly would not be distributing those, and that sort of the, the need for clearance was associated with the distribution of the devices. So it, 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 I mean, I guess it's fair to say that your discussions around FDA were about <coughs> clearance for a, a system that ultimately included the TSPU. Yes. Were any regulatory counsel involved in uh, either? this meeting or, or any meeting talking about the nanotainers? I, Just I, answer that yes or no in the first instance. Um, I, or I don't know. know. Did you share uh, Exhibit 231 with any of your counsel? Mm -hmm. yeah. but that you're, you're now, I mean, Okay. I think I'll, I'll, I'll take that. I, I mean, that, that may be an okay question, but like, I gotta think about that for a second. Well, Ms. Holmes was just talking about how her understanding was based on things that counsel had told her. Right, and you said you didn't want to ask her about what counsel had told her, and now you're asking what she gave them to elicit advice, which is an attorney-client communication. Well, and, and and you're going to the substance. No, no, no. Just sec. Wait a sec, please. You're going to the substance of the of the of the correspondence and you're asking whether she shared it with the lawyer. I'm, I'm not saying that I'm going to say no, but I want to understand like where we're going with this because it may be that that's an easy question and she can answer it and, and we're all fine. It may be that that we're that this is the camel's nose going under the tent, and before we get there, I'd like to make sure that I understand where, what, what, what you're doing. That's all. Is your understanding as to whether or not Theranos was permitted to continue um, Using the nanotainer is that was that predicated on any advice that you received from counsel? How about just asking whether um, she discussed the use of the nanotainer with the con continued use of the nanotainer with the counsel? Because you just asked what the outcome of the advice was. You think you can ask whether that topic was discussed with counsel, and you can ask the time frame for it the same way, kind of the same information you'd get on a priv log. I think that would be that would be responsive. Okay. To the Did you ever discuss uh, the topic of continuing to use the nanotainer after receiving Exhibit Two Thirty One with counsel? Yes. Which Oops. counsel? Um, I, I don't know how many different regulatory law firms we had involved at this time, but w whoever was acting as counsel, we would have discussed with probably all of them. Would be my guess. And who were your regulatory counsel? Who are you thinking of right now? Um, I, I don't know who it was in, in June of 14. I, I shared yesterday, I know we started with, and then we went to multiple law firms to get their advice on the definition of an LDT and what could in good standing qualify as an LDTs and got opinion memos 
Um, and then um, I think there were one or two others who we started working with after that. There, there was a, a lot of law firms we were asking for regulatory advice on this. I'm going to try to be careful here again, but yeah. did, did you ever seek any, um, any input from counsel uh, about the kinds of disclosures you should make to potential investors about their notice of status with the FDA? I, I understand what you're asking. I'm, it's not because I. Uh, um, There's probably a better way to ask that question, and I'm uh, and I'm open to suggestions. I guess I'm trying to get a sense of. Did did you talk to counsel about your disclosures to potential investors concerning the FDA? No problem. Yes or um, no? Or I don't remember. Yes. Okay. Which ones? Um, I. You can give the name of the Okay. Uh, Boy Schiller. Uh, who at Boy Schiller? Um, David Boyce. Do you recall the time frame for that conversation? Um, I mean, I, I believe he was actively attending board meetings by this point, and we, we discussed these topics um, in that context. I guess more broadly, did you, did you discuss what could be disclosed with potential investors uh, with the board? Um, I, I, I don't know if it was what could be disclosed, but just generally what we were disclosing, yes. I guess, did you ever share, uh, you know, we, we talked a little bit about the, the Murdoch financials before. Did, did, did you ever share that exhibit with the, with the board, to your recollection? I, I don't know if it was the exact same document, but those general assumptions of the way the retail footprint would ramp, yes. You can put that one aside. Sure. Let's take a quick break. We are off the record at 4 17 p.m. And this concludes media number three. <clears throat> we are back on the record at the beginning of media number four of Elizabeth Holmes. The time is 4 17. Ms. Holmes, did we have any substantive conversations during the break? No. I'm going to... Sorry, I didn't hear the answer. No. Thank you. I'm going to hand to you what's been marked. There it is, Exhibit 232. Exhibit 232 uh, reports to be a letter <coughs> from FDA to Theranos. The date of the letter is October 28, 2014, with starting dates number THER-0360329. Have you seen Exhibit 232 before? I don't know. Would you have expected to forward a letter that he received from FDA to your attention? Generally, yes. If you look on the first page, this is 329, it says, uh, third paragraph down in the middle of that paragraph, the email you received is your notification that the submission has been placed on hold. And uh, the I'm submission. Sorry, I oh, I see. Yes. Right. And okay. the submission in the first sentence is for Theranos's capillary and nanotainer tubes. Were you aware in October 2014 that Theranos had put this submission on hold? I don't think Theranos put it on hold. I, I read this to mean that oh, FDA. the FDA put it on hold. Sorry, I keep getting confused. Were you aware as of October 2014 that the FDA had put Theranos's uh, 510K? Uh, pre-market um, submission on hold for the capillary and nanotainer tubes? I, I hadn't remembered that um, previously. I had been thinking about that having happened in December, but I, I see that here. You thought that happened in December 2014? I, I did. I, I had the discussion with Okay, so if you turn to 330, which is the second page of Exhibit 232, Uh, 
Ashley, why don't you, head, sorry, if you can head back to 329 first. Under modified assays, it says here, you stated in the study design tables you provided in an email sent on November 20th, 2014, that you use FDA cleared or approved assays without any modifications. So is this what you were referring to earlier in your testimony that um, at Theranos agreed to provide data based on cleared or approved assays to support this application? Um, so I'm, I'm confused by the date because I think this is dated October of 2014. So I'm. You're mm. right. Do you do you remember sending an email with um, study design tables that included data where Theranos used FDA cleared or approved assays without any modifications? I, I'm honestly not sure what this is referring to. Um, I'm not clear. Okay. Sure. If you, if you continue reading in that paragraph, it says, however, we consider changing the sample matrix from venous blood samples to capillary blood samples to be an assay modification because the assay was validated by the manufacturer and cleared by the FDA for use with the venous blood. Changing the sample type from venous blood to capillary whole blood may have an impact on the performance of the assay that has been cleared or approved by FDA. And then if you turn the page um, to 330, the letter goes on to talk about how uh, glucose concentrations in capillary blood are often higher than venous blood. You can take a moment to read it if you haven't, which can have the effect of invalidating reference ranges. Did you see that discussion? I do, I'm just reading it quickly. Do you understand <coughs> FDA to be saying here that it was not okay for Theranos to be submitting data on uh, cleared devices uh, if those cleared devices were uh, being used to show the um, uh, being used to show that data on Theranos's devices were accurate because you were using those cleared devices with capillary blood and not with venous blood? So I, I actually don't remember this memo specifically, but I know that at a certain <coughs> point in time, FDA asked that we only submit on devices that were cleared for capillary samples. Okay. And what, when did you obtain that understanding? I don't know. Would it have been around this late 2014 time frame? I, I thought it was after that because I believe that we ended up getting agreement to send the submissions in for which we got feedback in December, and I don't think that all of those test systems were cleared for capillary use, um, but I, I could be wrong. So if you go on to 331, which is page 3 of Exhibit 232, in the middle of the page under 2, it says, in your submission you've provided testing using your Theranos capillary tubes and nanotainer tubes for the following analytes with modified assays that are not cleared for use with capillary blood samples, and there's a list. You should repeat testing for these analytes using unmodified assays cleared by the FDA for use with capillary blood samples. So here, FDA is saying 
you need to use devices that are cleared for capillary blood in, in order to submit your data, correct? I'm sorry, I lost you. Where are you? It's two. Oh, I was in the wrong one. Okay. Um, wait, yes, I see the sentence. So my question to you was, so <coughs> FDA is saying here to you that it was not okay to use um, modified assays that are not cleared for use with capillary blood and that you should use cleared assays that have been cleared for use with, cap uh, with capillary blood, correct? I believe for the specific analytes that are listed in the sentence above. Is that a yes? For those analytes, yes. And then if you turn to page four of exhibit 232 or three, it's number 332. For number three, and the letter goes on to say, we have serious concerns with many of the method comparison results provided in your submission. For example, the regression analysis you provided for albumin, potassium, and sodium obtained slopes of point 829, 1 1.415, and 0.884, respectively. Uh, we have not cleared a recent blood collection device that obtained results with such high bias. This high bias means there's a big difference between results generated by your CTN and the results generated by the comparative tube. It's very important that results obtained by your CTN generate accurate <coughs> results because patients could be harmed if an unnecessary medical treatment is used based on inaccurate diagnostic results. Do you see that? I do. <coughs> Were you aware that there was a high bias in your method comparison results and that this could lead to patient harm if patients uh, believed the inaccurate results and then acted upon them? No, actually my memory in general was that our team specifically disagreed with the statistics that were being applied in some of the bias calculations specifically. Who on your team was disagreeing with the bias data? I, I believe our, our biostatistics team. And who, who's that? Um, but I remember that we ended up having to engage directly with the FDA statisticians uh, about that. Uh, <coughs> was, it, or was there anyone else on this team that was involved in this? I think that was as well. Um, I'm not sure who else. I, I, I don't know who else. Okay. Uh, why don't you turn to page 8 of the document, which is 336. Under precision studies, number 15, do you see that? I do. So here, the letter states, we have serious concerns with many of the precision results provided in your submission. For example, the total precision percent CVs you obtained for potassium and ferritin were 8.0% and 19.12% respectively. These precision results were unusually, unusually large and unacceptable based on the comparison to the cleared assay's performance. And then, uh, a few lines down. It says, when repeating the precision studies for these analytes with unmodified assays, please ensure that you provide acceptable precision studies with results that could demonstrate um, your CTN do not contribute additional imprecision or change the imprecision to the results obtained by the cleared assay. Do you see that? I do. Were you aware that FDA believed that the precision data that Theranos had submitted uh, was concerning to them? I, I don't remember any specific discussions on precision. I know that our teams, um, again, were engaging with their statisticians, including on study design and the effect of pooling samples and other things that could impact variability in the results. When was your team working with the FDA statistici statisticians? I, I don't know specifically. Would it have been in this 2014 time frame, end of 2014 time frame? I, I don't know. Do you know whether the precision studies were ever submitted again to the FDA? I, I think we did a submission after this that resulted in the December call we were talking about 
And then I believe we did additional studies and submissions in 2015. What happened to the 510 k submission for the nanotainer in the end? The final submissions? Yes, what, what happened to the submission? Did you receive I, clearance or approval for the nanotainer? Only in the HSV-1 uh, clearance. What about for the other assays? No. So what happened to those submissions? I, I don't remember specifically. I think that after we, um, I, I don't remember. I, I, I believe that we, I'm trying to remember the sequencing of when we started looking at potentially exiting the clinical lab business and we stopped using the nanotainer. They'd given us feedback on our final set of submissions and I think we decided to pause work on everything except for trying to do root cause analysis of our business operations and fix the issues. Um, so I, I think we didn't follow the last set of feedback uh, from the agency. So, and when did you stop using the nanotainer? I believe it was in the fall of 15, or summer, late summer, fall of 15. Would it have been before or after FDA's inspection of fairness? Um, I think it was when FDA said they were going to issue quality systems observations on the nanotainer, on one of the nanotainers. So when FDA said they were going to issue a 43 with a deficiency about Theranos' nanotainers, that would have been the time where when you pulled the nanotainer from use? Y yes, and just to be clear, it was on one of our nanotainers, not on the other one. Did you ever tell a prospective investors that FDA had concerns with the data that Theranos had submitted for the nanotainer device? Again, I, I don't remember conversations specifically <coughs> on this, but I know we were talking about the fact that we were trying to get the nanotainers through and trying to work with the agency on feedback about them. So you don't know either way whether you told them that there were serious concerns from the FDA over use of the nanotainer device? I, I don't know what we specifically said. So in the middle of an hour, are you done with that document? Uh, yes, you can put aside. Right We're off record at 4.34 p.m. We are back on the record at 5.25. Ms. Holmes, we have no further questions at this time. We will be... So, sorry, yeah. we didn't have any substantive discussions with the staff during the break. Is that correct? And I did not. <laughs> during, a, during the break or all week? <laughs> <laughs> we have no further questions at this time. We will be adjourning testimony to a later date. But thank you for coming in. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks. This this concludes media number four and volume two of Elizabeth Holmes. We're off the record at 526.